It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got a great panel. Harry McCracken, the technologizer, is here. Let's see. This would be Harry's, i got to do some quick math, 16th year on the show. <laughs> Kathy Gellis' second year on the show. She's our attorney. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the big cases coming up in front of the Supreme Court. And from Consumer Reports, senior uh, technology uh, reporter, uh, Nicholas De Leon. We've got a lot to talk about. AI is in the news. They've opened up Blue Sky. What's the future of social media? And the passing of two legends in the technology industry. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is, is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 966. Recorded Sunday. February 11th, 2024. He's got a huge corpus. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Bitwarden, the password manager offering a cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Account switching has come to the Bitwarden browser extensions. Now users can log in to up to five separate accounts and switch seamlessly between them in the desktop and mobile apps and browsers too. That's a great way to keep your work and personal accounts safely separated. For organizations as self-host, Bitwarden has developed a Helm chart to enable deployments to Kubernetes clusters. This allows companies already using Kubernetes to keep their software stack simplified. You don't have to add a new service. And of course, bottom line, everybody should know you got to use a password manager, and there's no better password manager than the open source Bitwarden for free forever for individuals, runs on every platform, supports pass keys, supports hardware keys, and it makes it easy to generate and manage your complex passwords. Don't reuse passwords. Use Bitwarden. It's a trusted credential management solution. It's the only one I use, the only one I trust. Get started with Bitwarden's free trial of a team or enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user. I love that because it's open source. It's free forever. Bitwarden.com slash twit. Look, I know you use a password manager, but if your friends aren't, if your family's not, tell them about Bitwarden. Bitwarden.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in uh, Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Could not have a better panel for you today. Uh, we are doing it a little bit early if you're watching live, about an hour early, uh, because there's uh, some game or something going on a little later on. And maybe we have a dog in that particular hunt. And by the way, uh, I did put the football game up in my computer at home, I mean, uh, in the office, if you would like to put it over there. Also here, Nicholas De Leon from Consumer Reports, now uh, relocated to the beautiful Southwest. You look you yes. look like you're there, boy. You're in Tucson, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm in uh, suburban Tucson north about 30 minutes. But nice. yeah, uh, moved, moved to Tucson about a year ago from New York, and uh, it's been pretty cool so far, actually. Yeah, good. Always great to have you on, Nicholas. In studio with us, you're going to have to challenge, Nicholas. You're going to have to pipe right in because i got two people yeah. sitting next to me today. Kathy Gellis is here. She is uh, a uh, author at Tech Dirt. She's also an expert in uh, IP law. CGcouncil.com is her website. Hi, Kathy. Great to see you. Same here. Welcome. She is here now for the second or third time, so you get your own... Uh, personalized headphones yes isn't that nice yes. <laughs> harry mccrack has been here more than almost anybody <laughs> harry mccrack the technologizer currently global technology editor at uh, fast company where you've been doing a lot of writing you've been writing about the vision pro i have a vision pro on hand i'm surprised uh, i thought you of all people would be skeptical well um me of all people I'm the there, reason there's... i say that is because i'm skeptical and i feel like people who have a history with this stuff aren't going to get ex over excited about it because well, we've been there. It's an interesting mix of, of excitement and skepticism because it, it's both amazing and in some ways impractical at the same time. Yeah. There's a great clip uh, that I found on Reddit of Steve Jobs at the All Things D conference in 2003 or five talking about, well, let me, in fact, let me play it for you uh, because I think it's kind of an interesting um, insight into what, 
what Apple's up to. And I guess Steve Jobs must have kind of known that they were going to be working on this. This is from All Things D. Um, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem here is that headphones were a miraculous thing. You put a pair of headphones and you get the same experience you get with a great pair of speakers, right? There's no such thing as headphones for video, right? There's, no, there's not something I can carry with me that I can put on and it gives me the same experience I get when I'm watching my, you know, 50-inch plasma display at home. And, in, you know, until somebody invents that, you're going to have these opposing constraints. Well, they, they well, somebody had invented it shortly thereafter. Well, yes, with all due respect to Steve, a lot has happened since then. Yeah. And, and uh, the Vision Pro is not the equivalent of a, a giant screen, but it's certainly way closer than... I would have expected it. I liked today. his analogy, though, of it's headphones for the eyes, because it is in a way. But the pro but for some reason, for me, I don't mind wearing headphones, maybe because I've grown up with headphones on. But I'm at a little bit. I do not like the experience of putting those on my eyes. I just don't like it. It, it gets old after a while. Although I have to say that I, I've been using it for maybe a couple of hours and kind of being amazed enough that I forget I have that on my well, head. And you, you bought it, or did Fast Company I, buy this it? Is, this is a review unit review from, from unit. Uh, okay. Apple. Okay. Would you buy it? I wouldn't rush out right now. And I, I mean, if it was like a thousand bucks, it would be a no-brainer. Well, and I'm sure it will be uh, in a few years. It's not going to be anytime soon. 3500 is, is yeah. enough that I can theoretically get it, but it would be a, a pretty large decision, and I'm, I'm still thinking it over. I have to send these back to Apple at some point, right. so at, at some point I will have to make that decision. We have to make the same decision because uh, we got one from Micah so he could try it, but you only get two weeks, <laughs> and uh, we're going to have to return it on Friday. So You just <laughs> start to, to figure out decision. how not to walk into walls, and then yeah. <laughs> you have to send it back. Yeah, <laughs> you've just got it. How about you, Nicholas? Have you tried the uh, Vision Pros yet? No, uh, we didn't get one. Uh, we usually get Apple stuff, but we didn't get the Vision Pro, uh, and we didn't buy. We were we were debating it internally. Should we buy this thing? Uh, I think like Harry, you know, thirty five hundred for something that I don't know that our audience is super interested in. Uh, I mean, even I'm kind of like, you know, because I've used the Oculus, I've I've used a lot of these things, and I usually use them for like you know a week, let's say, and then never use them again. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Yeah, I that was I, that I was. I would, go ahead. I think I would use that. I would not put it in the in the back of a drawer, probably. But the question is, would I use it enough to feel like I was getting my thirty five hundred dollars worth? Not sure it would fit in the back of the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> you need a big drawer, especially in the drawer. case. Uh, yeah, the two hundred dollar case is like yay big. It's big. So, uh, so I have, uh, and I, 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 I feel kind of like before I could talk about this, I have to establish my credentials, or people will go, "Oh, Leo, you're just old and in the way." But I first tried a VR headset in 1992 at SIGGRAPH. Wow. I don't know if you were right. did that one, but you were riding a pterodactyl. So there was a like bicycle handlebar and a saddle. And then, of course, a giant headset in those days attached to a silicon graphics computer via a big tether. But it was that same experience when you first put these things on where you go, oh. <gasps> It's it's I'm I think I'm flying. It's very vivid, and I've I was a Kickstarter on the Oculus Rift when it first came out. I got the second one, got the third one. I bought the Meta Pro, the Quest Pro, for fourteen hundred dollars. That's my most recent purchase. We've had the we had the HTC Vive at home. Mostly, my kid wears them to play games. It's I always have the same experience, exactly the same experience. Which I put it on, it's breathtaking. There's a plank walk the plank game on the uh, quest where you know you're standing on a solid floor but you can't bring yourself to go out the door 300 feet up and walk out on this plank because your body goes no 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 you're gonna fall that's amazing and so i've had those experiences where you go wow groundbreaking it looked like it broke the ground <laughs> Literally, yeah. but inevitably uh, they gathered th like my Quest Pro is sitting on my shelf in my office and there's a layer of dust on it. There just, isn't just as you said, Nicholas, it's like you don't. Yeah, it's not something you end up using. Uh, it's interesting well, to hear Harry. Say I mean, the um, one thing I wrote about on Fast Company is the fact that Apple calls the Vision Pro a, a spatial computer. And I think the computer part of that is meaningful. They, it's not purely an entertainment device. It runs a lot of apps because it will run most iPad apps. I've, I've been writing in it. It, it. it runs our Fast Company VPN. Um, there's well, almost, that's interesting. There's almost, no, there's almost nothing I can't theoretically accomplish on the Vision Pro. So the big question is, is there any actual value to doing it? And in some cases, the answer to that is yes. And in others, no. It's just more practical to use a laptop or an iPad. I feel like Apple's 
calling it spatial computing is pure marketing. They just don't want you to think it's a VR. Um, it's cer that's certainly partially wanting to avoid everybody else's buzzwords, but yeah. I, I do think they think of it more as like a well-rounded computing device than, than the than the um, Quest headsets, which are clear, clearly they're for gaming ent entertainment. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, and they're VR. Although uh, the Vision Pro is. Not exactly augmented reality. I mean, yes, you can see the background, but well, they, and, um, and all the stupid Tesla people driving their cyber trucks, notwithstanding, it's not a the Quest device 3, that you are work in the real world with. No, I mean, you're, all of these things you're going to use at home um, with and and in unless, a virtual reality, unless you're crazy. Yeah, I mean, just because you could see your desk, but doesn't mean that that 15 inch Mac screen that's blown up to 80 inches in front of you isn't virtual. You're not interacting with the outside world and the... You can do a little more. In fact, I, I was using it while watching my TV TV the other day. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the gift that somebody just posted. The guy got out of a cyber truck and yeah. is blundering around the parking lot. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is uh, stimulated by the incessant need for clicks on YouTube. <laughs> I don't think it has a lot to do with a real use case. Although Casey Neistat, a YouTuber... Uh, was skateboarding. He rode the subway. Um, I, this is these are all silly applications. Nobody. It's not Apple doesn't intend for this, and I don't think uh, anybody is expected or will do this. Well, I go back to this. What we started with, with oh, well, we're used to wearing headphones. If you wear headphones on both ears as you're out in reality, that's dangerous. It's yeah. dangerous, yeah. and you're not participating in reality in the same way, and that's going to not only be dangerous for you, but irk the society around you that you are not interacting with in the same way. I, that's my biggest uh, problem with it, actually, is that, do we need another device to isolate us from the people around us? I mean, it sounds like Steve Jobs was like, yes, let's have the other device <laughs> that isolates us. Um, right. We've done it for our ears. Let's do it for our eyes. Yeah, but interestingly, uh, earphones have evolved, in fact, especially from Apple, to be transparent so you can hear what's going on around you, to, uh, to, make, to not isolate you. Mm. And um, I have a bone conduction pair, which are great because yeah, I, I, the, I can yeah. hear. So I can. the aftershocks you put I've them on your temple. I've not tested it, but I've just been. I'm, I'm reluctant to. Like I don't even have the earphones in both ears right now. There's something about clogging up my senses that makes me very disoriented. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Nicholas, I think it's telling that Apple decided not to send a, a review unit to Consumer Reports. They probably agree I with mean, you. It's not a consumer product, particularly. I, I, this is one of the hardest Apple products, uh, I guess, ever, you know, in my 15-ish years of doing this, to figure out, like, like what, what it is type of thing. Uh, it, obviously, the tech is very impressive. You know, I've, I've watched all the reviews. I've read all the reviews. It's, it's super neat, but, like, Especially my audience, like Consumer Reports, these are very mainstream. You know, these are just the moms and dads of America, basically. Uh, where would this device fit into their life? Uh, I, I haven't really. The closest that I saw was the Joanna Stern review where she was using it in cooking and she had bits of timers, different timers, while she's, which is like, that's cool. But like, who's, you know, are you going to cook with, you know, uh, with the headset on? I don't, I don't know. So, yeah, this was a tricky thing for me to figure out. And I, I'm not even really sure where I've landed yet. To be fair, I haven't used it. Uh, so I can't really speak too too much in depth. But it's it's a tricky one. Yeah, I don't know. I've used it very briefly, you know. Uh, used Micah's. Uh, so it wasn't tuned for me. It wasn't designed for me. You better uh, be cooking something that takes less than two hours. Cause that's, oh, that's the that's, limit? That's about how much battery <laughs> life you'll get. Oh, yeah, the, it'll die. Yeah, you can plug it in, though, and, and yes. add an extra sitting, battery. Sit, sitting... Uh, in a, a chair, you can just plug it in and um, this is the, the very famous Gardner hype cycle where you, you get a technology trigger, something like, you know, the release of the Vision Pro, the peak of inflated expectations. That's kind of maybe where we are. Then the trough of disillusionment. But then it's followed by a, a shallower slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity where something isn't as uh, big as the hype might have thought, but it's going to but it's useful and. Where would you where would you say this is going to end up on uh, on the Gartner graph? I mean, I think it's dependent on what comes after this initial Vision Pro. If, if it stays thirty five hundred dollars forever, it's going to have a, a pretty limited market. But I thought that they might uh, this year have a less expensive one, and I've been told by the, all the Apple experts, no, expect nothing for a couple of years before. It might see. take a while. Um, yeah. The other thing is like one of the things people thought would be 
either potentially game changing, although also weird is is the eyesight feature that where, was terrible. where it mimics your eyes on the outside. It doesn't even do anything. It turns out people can barely see them. Yeah. So it, it's, it's useless. It seems somewhat useless. It, yeah. kind of, it kind of reminds me of the touch bar on the MacBook Pro. It's it, worse than it's, that. It's something that will probably go away because it just is neither yeah. here nor there. I think some of this is a solution looking for a problem as opposed to a problem looking for a solution, which I think is a much better way to have an ultimately successful product. You may get a solution that has other uses. It gets adopted in other ways, but I think that's a much more sustainable way of really driving innovation forward. The one difference here is I think, you know, in that chart, a startup will go bankrupt as it just starts to come out of that dip. Apple can capitalize this as long Mm -hmm. on the line as they want. And I think one of the questions is, what is Apple ultimately shooting for? Because right now, I don't think it's got anything compelling which would justify dumping the resources indefinitely on this, but this may just be stepping stones to them and they just may not be talking about what the stepping stones are in the direction of. Also, haven't we already learned from previous experience that this is not, that's a lot of hubris on Apple's part to say, well, no, but we can make it a hit. When nothing, I mean, Meta has, I think, basically turned their back on it. Microsoft absolutely has turned their back on HoloLens. Um, other companies have tried and failed at this. Well, what, what <laughs> Just because Apple has trillions of dollars doesn't yeah. mean they... Well, I think they have an idea of this is a, an opening volley in, in some place they want to go. Oh, and I the, know that, and for the, sure. Yeah. The question I have in terms of what this what would be a good use that this could be driving and technology to integrate with is adaptive technologies. And I'm thinking, and I dumped a URL at the, in the rundown for, I don't know if this is vaporware or something that's really coming, but there were some people coming out of Stanford who wanted to put live transcription that would project on your glasses. So that- Oh, I think things like this do. absolutely are coming, but that's yeah. true AR. We're not close to this yet, are we? I mean, I don't know. They, they they think they are. I've heard this is maybe overhyped, but I thought it was oh. really, really interesting. <laughs> By the way, yeah. okay. So the yeah. picture on the front page looks like a normal pair of glasses. Then you get to the actual ones, and they look a lot more like right. Google Glass. They do, but the price is also pretty reasonable, and um, they're compatible with the glasses you already have. Oh, you snap them onto the glasses. If, yeah. if these are the ones that's that you have, yes. smart. They are. So You're right. if this yeah. technology works, a it's got a compelling use. Um, and we've got, and then you're marrying two technologies that exist. One, live captioning, which is a technology that's existing separately. And two, whether you can do the projection in a way that works, but that's actually something where you may have a real problem. This technology would improve people's lives and it may not be such a leap where maybe this is accessible, assuming that the projection this, part works right. This might also do very well with uh, the latest uh, generation who keeps the subtitles on all the time. I thought it was just me as an old guy, but I, people your age, Nicholas, watch TV with subtitles on all the time. I, I've done that actually, I guess most of my life. I, I guess it caught on recently. But yeah, anything I'm watching, whether it's like Food Network or you know the big game later today, uh, I'll have captions on. Yeah. Yeah, I have it on one of my TVs and not my other TV. And on the one that it's not there, I really miss it. So this isn't really just for translation. This could just be to caption what's going on. This is, I I agree with you. This is a product I could see people using. What if your AI is tied to this? And not, is it, not only is it captions, but it's also telling you information about the things you're looking at. Uh, that's kind of what Meta's Ray-Ban is aiming at as well. Eye tracking, which actually has been around for a long time as an assistive technology and has worked really well. Um, Toby is this company that's that's done it for people who, who really need to have eye tracking to um, interact with computers. And um, it's worked well for a long time. Um, but, it wor- but it's certainly one, one of the key things that makes Vision Pro interesting is that the eye tracking works really well and does not require a lot of training on your part. This is transcribeglass.com. Uh, I don't know if they're actually offering it yet. It's it's a sign up for a wait list. Did they say what the price? If this I, is the one I'm thinking of, it's um, I think I don't remember exactly, but like under 200, I think. Maybe. Wow. Yeah, this is Google Glass basically. This is what I thought Google was going to do with Google Glass. Well, I think it's less about um, input. It, this is really just focusing on the projection, right. and it's trying. Okay. And because it's focused on that, it's more likely to get it right because it's trying to be that. Nobody's going to use it if it's intrusive. So the question is whether for people who are using it, is it giving them something that is giving them the the captioning in a way that's effective? And is it doing it in a way that's not deteriorating their overall vision experience? And, you know, in their own promos and their users seem to say yes, but um, 
I guess that's the question. It's interesting. This is, uh, and, and I think often in technology, this is what you want. Companies coming at the similar problem from two different ends. One, the low tech, less expensive end. One, the spare no expense, make the most elaborate technology you can. Uh, and then let's see what happens, right? So I'd I'm glad that there's something like this. I would rather class. bet on this and I'd rather support this. Too. And I'm worried yeah. that when you go for, it doesn't count unless it's full VR and flashy and you know hot off the press from Apple or Meta or whatever. I think that tends to starve the better incremental things that if this works, I mean, this would make people who have hearing deficiencies a much more Huge. livable experience. Huge. Like that's worth focusing on. And then, yeah, if you can do screen projection on glasses, there's other things you can do with it. But uh, having that as the driving purpose means you'll probably innovate the technology more effectively and make it therefore more usable to be applied to other problems. This is a fraction of the cost of hearing aids. And I think in many cases, this would be preferable to it. To a set of it, it uses a smartphone, so there's not a, you know, v right. Vision Pro is a computer on your head. Right. This is not a computer in your glasses. Yeah. Right. Uh, the this, computer is in your is, pocket. This is just one application. Um, the Vision Pro is trying to do all the things. Do it all. This is just one of the things. Yeah. And then you run into a problem, though, obviously, if some technologies is one of the things, and then you need another technology to do the other things. One of the innovations of the smartphone is we kind of got them all in one thing but you know let that convergence happen naturally you can start by we've got discrete things that are solving discrete problems well and then based on how well they've solved them then better to take a well done solution and apply it to a new problem than a crappy solution and apply it to everything else yeah well uh, we, I guess we won't know for, when do you think we'll have an idea of uh, whether the Vision Pro is a hit? I mean, they're going to sell everyone they can make all this year, which is a maximum, I think, of, it's estimated 800,000 because of Sony's limitations. It seems like maybe for the first year or so, it will glide on that critical mass of people who are excited right. about it because right. it's cool. And what comes after that is interesting. Whether Apple can do something that's nearly as good for a lot less money. This seems to be something of an unsolved question. I noticed, by the way, and you've always brought the iPad. You use the iPad as your main work machine. Some have said that the Vision Pro is almost an iPad killer, that it's the next iPad. Well, the apps are very similar. And in fact, they you, are iPad. It's you can, iPad OS. The, so. You can run iPad apps, and even the Vision Pro apps feel a lot. They feel much more like a iPad app than an iPhone app or a Mac app. Yeah. Yeah. And and they've done, uh, from my experience and what I've heard, the eye tracking and the, and the, Little gestures are very good. It very works well really done. well. Yeah, um, you can pick it up in a few minutes for the most part. Did uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, abandon uh, Meta uh, Quest too early? I guess he hasn't really abandoned it. Abandon fact. seems a little extreme, but yeah. he, he has sort of rushed his, on to AI yeah, lately. His understandably, has shifted. but they go together in a way. They hand in hand. Didn't uh, he just say something the other day about his personal goal is to keep dumping resources into the VR and the questions whether. Any of the other board of directors are going to be cool with that. <laughs> well, that's all, always the problem. And I think Apple has that same problem is how long, how much runway do you have? It's not just how much money do you have, but how long will the board let you do this and the stakeholders let He's you do He's still this? talking about the metaverse. He's like, yeah. he may be the only person left who is, but he hasn't lost his In a way, his Apple has uh, given their seal of approval. He says, we want to be the Android of the metaverse. Let Apple be Apple. We'll be the Android of the metaverse. That kind of proves the, the, the category. I mean, I... I I'm looking at him like a news and like somebody else has done large goggles you can stick on your head. And um, <laughs> I thought we were like over that because everybody walked around looking <laughs> silly. But I no, know. apparently more people want to walk around you looking You cannot silly. underestimate the... Uh, Interest in walking around and looking the, silly. No, the drag that that puts on a product. I mean, the Segway, which I thought was a great product. We had them and I love them. <laughs> and I miss my Segways. But because you looked like an idiot riding them around. I think that, that you can't underestimate the drag that puts on a technology product. And there's no way to get around the fact that people in VR look dopey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we got used to, I thought dopey was the AirPods right. dripping out of your ear. We got used to that. Maybe we can get used to this. Uh, there was a time when I felt very uncomfortable using a, a laptop in a meeting at work. Right. It, it, was, it, was everybody does. it was considered antisocial. It's quite the opposite now. If you yes. don't have a laptop, I wonder. <laughs> are you paying attention? What are you doing? Exactly. Why are you here without your laptop? <laughs> what? Are you, he's paying too much attention. <laughs> yeah, you're listening? Stop staring. Stop it. Knock it off. <laughs> Find something else to look at. <laughs> so, Nicholas, uh, you actually represent an interesting point of view, which I haven't heard, which is that this is not a product for average people 
for normal people. This is for early adopters, enthusiasts, people with uh, excess income. It's not for yeah. it's not for Main Street America. I mean, that's that's what it feels like, and I guess that that's cool too. You know, I'm usually an early adopter. I'm a nerd. I usually buy all the stuff immediately. But this here, the thirty five hundred dollar price point was like. Uh, especially given my my uh, history with other headsets, and I know that I use them for a little bit, and then I don't use them ever again. You know, is a Vision Pro is it is it the one that changes my mind? Perhaps, but at thirty five hundred dollars, I was not going to no. try it out per se. But yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen any. No one has sent me questions uh, uh, about the Vision Pro a Consumer Report. Oh, what do you got? Where's the review, you guys? No one, no one says <laughs> no that. No one me. says that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, think- you know, maybe. I'm just wondering about the Consumer Reports rating system for these types of products. I'm thinking about like the little dot system that's used for car safety. Yeah. And like, what would the dot system be yeah. for yeah. these headsets? But well, we didn't even buy it, so, you know. We'll never no know. dot system that's, that's for We'll never know. Yeah. Even I am struggling with the, kind of the question of um, to what the radio factor in the price. Uh, when, when I used to work at PC World, we'd have these heated arguments about whether the review should simply judge how good something is and let the reader decide how much they want to pay or whether you factor in the price. And I'm not sure if we ever quite settled on that. And with this, it's very hard to figure out whether you should just say, okay, this is $3,500 and then judge it based on purely on how worthwhile it is. Back in the day with PC Mag and PC World, there was a star system, a rating system, a numeric system. Nowadays, I see much more on the wire cutter and other, other sites, a pros and cons column. And the con is always pricey right. <laughs> this yeah. would be yeah. definitely a con we pricey. Had, yeah we had like i think we had a score from one to 100 at one point and we, we'd argue about like is how a many fi- points does it cost and, you and like is, is a 50 a, a perfectly mediocre ochre product right like if a product is terrible is it a one <laughs> where um, do you put it That's a lot a of pro- argument a lot of products tended to bunch up around 70 75 right. 80 right i mean 3500 for this d- type of computing may not actually be disproportionately expensive given what it is. Oh, no, is. absolutely not. It may actually be like a fair price for what it is, but do you need it? Like if you've got $3,500 yeah. coming out of your ears and you're looking for a place to spend it, it may not be the most stupid thing you could spend it on, but most can, people need honestly, the 3500 My last Mac laptop was more. It was four or $5,000 because I got an M3. And I didn't have a, I mean, it's a lot of money. But I understood the utility. I understood what, how much, how many years I was going to get out of it. So I could have, I could have paid thirty five hundred dollars for this thing. In fact, I got right. I went through the whole purchase price process in the, on day one, hovered my finger over the buy button, and thought, you know, what? it's just going to sit on my shelf in a week or two weeks or three, and it's not, a, it's not just not sensible. And I think that was ultimately what stopped me. It's just it, I don't have a use case for it. And I can't justify spending that kind of money for something that's just for fun, cool for a few weeks. Yeah. That's just not enough. That's just not enough. Maybe Apple someday down the road. How? What is our responsibility, Harry? And I, I guess I'll, I'll ask you too, Nicholas, because you both write for the public. Yeah. What is our responsibility to say... This is this is not for you. This is not a. This is Apple's almost a beta test, a first release of something that they think down the road will be useful, maybe in generation two, three, four. What then? What is your responsibility uh, to your public? You have to say this is not for you. I think, right, Nicholas? I mean, you have to say. Yeah. No. I. I and I think that's fair to say too. Like you know, we're evaluating this device on its own merits. You know, it executes the uh, the. It, what it wanted to do, it does it very well. Great, hooray! Uh, but does that really fit into your life if you're, you know, a, a family in Danbury, Connecticut? Uh, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. That's that's a different. That's almost a different. That's almost a different review, frankly. Yeah. You know, I a lot of the Apple. Kind of, oh, you could watch Apple TV. You could watch Napoleon uh, on the. It's like okay, but like, wouldn't I want to watch a movie with my family on the couch? Like, so I don't. I don't really know how it fits socially. Like, as just that's as right. a device. Cool, right. awesome. It's it's a ten out of ten is is what it seems like. But how does this actually fit into your life as as a person? That's a different that's a different set of uh, considerations. I think. Is there a pressure, Harry, to kind of say, well, but I want to give them credit and I want to encourage them to innovate and I want to give them credit for innovating. So I don't want to dismiss it. Well, I think it's possible to c- capture both what it is now and where it might go. And I mean, every publication looks at it from a different perspective. I mean, Fast Company, we're not going to beat The Verge or Consumer Reports at right. doing straight out buying advice. So um, 
So my goals are a little different. I, I'm interested in it as a platform. So you're the, you're, for um, you, it's appropriate to write about it because uh, you're writing right. about something that's a continuity. Personally, I, I mean, I've been I've been sitting in it, kind of using it for everyday work, and that's right. I'm going to write about that. Um, when does the day come though where you go, God, I don't want to put it on again, but I got to write about it? You're going to have that. <laughs> you're going to have that moment. I'm not there yet. I, I also at first I thought maybe I would use it 100 percent for a while just yeah. to see what happened. Which you did with the iPad. And I, I kind of realized that, I mean, it's pointless to wear it if um, it becomes a burden. And so um, after a couple of hours or so, I would take it off yeah. and use something yeah. else for a while and recharge and come back to it. One of the trick things I'm, I'm hearing and I'm observing with other people, but I don't share is upending my, I'm a creature of habit. I want technology that's set up and it works for me and we're done. And I don't want to touch it. I don't because want to. Flex. You're not an early adopter. You're a user. I'm not entirely well. You want to. You're productivity focused. I'm productivity focused. I wouldn't say I'm not an, a complete. I'll beta. You're open to new I'm, stuff. I'm not. For sure. I'm less an alpha. Right. Um, more right. a beta person. Right. I'm thinking of my grandfather though, who was definitely an early adopter. Like we had a V. He had a VCR in 1979. Wow. Um, so um, I guess it didn't. Completely inherit that. Probably but most I of our to be, audience I is early, early adopters. I can think but, things are cool, but uh, you know, not for the. There's a time and place for when I want ooh, cool, shiny I object, agree. but not, that's not what I would want to rely on to be a, pro, a productive person. And right. I need these tools to keep me as a productive person. So there's a limit to how much chance I'm going to take, and it also means that. I don't want to like have to swap out my machine. I don't want to try this. I don't want to develop new routines. I don't want to. I don't want the change. I don't want to. But um, well, most I, people are like that, and for most people, that's the sensible way to go about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and there, to be open to new yeah. ideas is a great thing. You know, I mean, that's why we talk. We're talking about it kind of incessantly, even though personally, I don't see a future for it. Um, but we, but but it, but you have to talk about because it it's interesting, when not it, because of the uh, the hype. You know, this, there will be. I'm I'm waiting. I'm kind of in that corner of my eye, looking at the Super Bowl broadcast because mm -hmm. there will be a two minute Apple. It's seven million dollars per thirty seconds. <laughs> Apple is sponsoring the halftime. I think there will be, or will there? Maybe this is the question. I mean, Apple doesn't need to advertise this. Nobody can buy it. At this point, you know, you, you have to pre-order it way ahead. They're going to sell it out no matter what. They're going to have what. something to write off on their taxes. I guess maybe it's a tax deduction. <laughs> <laughs> what, but the thing is, if they don't... So, so what they aren't going to do and they are not doing is buying ads for the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac. They've got a whole product line that's actually their bread and butter that they ignore by promoting the Vision Pro so strongly. And there's no, there's no at least not in the next couple of years, upside to the Vision Pro. It's a very much a long... But I think they're definitely playing a long game because this wouldn't necessarily... I mean, they're probably subsidizing it. Even to get a $3,500 price seems like there's a huge subsidy going into it somewhere. I've wondered about that. You think they make? They don't make money on it? Uh, I saw I Fix It did a teardown, but I didn't see if they yeah. attempted to guess how much the components cost. I mean, if you're only producing 800,000 on Even units. if they make $1,000 a unit, it's less than a billion dollars. It's yeah. not a profit. It's not going to be profitable. And if you, have, if you buy it for a two-minute ad... That's $28 million for one ad well, on the Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm curious about the teardown. Like, where did they get the parts? Where did they get the components? Is this reuse of components they, I don't think you did? could do a bill of, bill of materials it's, on this. I mean, the two 4K screens is expensive stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, uh, look, we're talking about it. They got they got the attention of the world. Is it good for the Apple brand as an innovator? Like, okay, Apple's well, on the cutting what's edge. What's distinctively interesting about this, which I kind of like, I, I want to be cynical. I will be cynical, but I'm less cynical about this than I am about Meta um, and their device because this isn't just pure VR. Right. And the idea about bringing full capacity computing into just another physical space. That is an intriguing idea. And I think the reason if they're gonna run an ad is because they're gonna be like, we're here and they wanna run the table on that and like really set the innovation agenda. Um, and I think we'll actually, if they can drive other companies to react, I think we get something much better than, oh, we're just gonna build VR devices. The idea of like, you're gonna put a screen and a circuit together, look what you can do when you put a screen and a circuit together, um, that is exciting from an innovation standpoint. And that's a more interesting story than the ones who are just, we've put the screen and the circuit together and all you're going to get is our weird VR world. And the iPhone did that for smartphones because mm -hmm. 
without the iPhone, we would not have Android in the, in right. the form. That they put it, a screen and a circuit together and look where, and, and it got really interesting because you could converge so many things just by having computing power in a convenient place. It isn't Apple's typical uh, MO, though, to release something that isn't immediately of uh, you know useful. I mean, even the original iPhone or the Newton, they thought these were pro tools that were productive today. Those were all uh, the, with Steve Jobs. This is a yeah. post. -Steve I mean, the Jobs. Vision Pro feels like more like a like a beta project, a research. Yeah. A almost should be a developer edition. Yeah. If you're into entertainment and can reasonably spend thirty five hundred dollars, I think it's a reasonably compelling product or right watching now. Watching movies or and yeah. And also, the other thing I learned is um, watch. If you're into watching video by yourself, it's compelling. If you want to watch it with somebody else in your house, <laughs> like, poor Marie doesn't ever get to watch yes, those. I, well, I was what do you, how does that feel, Marie? Your wife is here. <laughs> do you like it when Harry's watching a movie and you're just sitting there? No, she's been surprisingly patient. But I, I was watching. <laughs> I was watching patient. this. I was watching this Netflix thing on Studio Fifty Four on the Vision Pro and yeah. enjoying it. And my, and my immediate response was like, "You ought to see hey, this. Have you seen this? Yeah. Let's watch it together." Yeah, that's my biggest problem with it. Is I don't. Apple's already uh, released one incredibly isolating product, the iPhone, and uh, I, I I don't I don't think they want to be known a hundred years from now as the company that destroyed the world by changing us you know biologically to not to be isolated we're humans are tribal we're community driven we're we do things together and i think we're best at our best when we do things together well the accusations about silicon valley is nobody's really thinking that through everybody who's involved with these decisions is going to be long gone before we find out that we've they ruined the humanity yeah, they don't care. the interesting thing is given all of our pending apocalypses we may actually get to see the end of the world in our oh, lifetime. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. I'm depressed already. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a little break, come back with more. That's it. That's the Vision Pro. we got to do it. We'll stop in a couple of weeks, probably stop talking about it completely. But we had to do it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> one more time. <laughs> one more time. You know, honestly, I think six months from now, nobody will be talking about it at all. I really, I feel like it's just going to be. Yeah. See what the Christmas Black, uh, you know, the Black Friday specials will be. <laughs> I'm actually, the next number I'm interested in, we'll never know, is how many people return them. Because you have two weeks, mm. uh, which means that the returns will start this week. I wonder if 10%, 20%, 30%, it could be a large number. I'm sure somebody will try to figure that out. I, I suspect there'll be more return than Apple would Can like. they be sanitized successfully for reuse? Apple takes them back. Oh, yeah, you probably take it apart and for parts. You can replace the, um, the, the actual thing your, your face rests on as removable. Okay. Ew. That's the problem right there in a nutshell. I don't want something to put on my face. My ears is one thing. Eyes is another. Our show today, thank you. It's great to have you. Harry McCracken's here, the technologizer from Fast Company. Kathy Gellis, attorney at law and from Consumer Reports. I always want to call it Consumers Union, but the official name is Consumer Reports. Now they're senior electronics reporter, Nicholas De Leon. It's great to have you, Nicholas. Our thank show you. today brought to you by Miro. Miro, I love Miro. It's hard for me to communicate how great Miro is. You got to try it, but the good news you can for free. I'll tell you about that in a second. What is Miro? It's one incredible visual place that brings all your innovative work together in one spot. And it doesn't matter where you are located, where your team is located. You could be in different time zones, but you're all on the same page. And I love that. We're talking six whole capability bundles. This makes it easy if you're in product development, you've got your workflows there or content visualization. It's great for innovators. I think it's great for anybody who works with a team, but it's even great as an individual to do uh, brainstorming. All powered by Miro AI. Now, this is a nice new feature. It means you're instantly generating new ideas or summarizing complex information. Miro connects all to the platforms you're already using. You're not going to leave them behind. You've got Jira or Confluence. We use Google Docs with it. We use Zapier with it, Asana. But what it does, it brings all that work together in one place. You don't ever have to leave Miro to use those tools or update the statuses or, or get more information in there. It's all happening inside Miro with the tools you already use. It centralizes your work. Miro users report saving up to 80 hours a year. 
because they streamline conversations. They cut down on meetings. They say all the most up-to-date information in, in a single place. In fact, it's a really great way to give feedback if you're working on a product, you know, one of the big processes is brainstorming. It's great for that. And then the second stage is feedback. They even have a board recording feature now they use called TalkTrack. This is great for teams that are in different time zones. You can record your thoughts, leave them on the board. Don't have to schedule another meeting. You can you can do that, you know, asynchronously. Look, you got to... The whole point is, it's hard for me to describe this. You've got to try it for yourself. See how it fits with your workflow. I guarantee you, you're going to see how innovative it is. Three boards free. Yes, your first three boards are free to start working better at Miro.com slash podcast. M-I-R-O dot C-O-M slash podcast. Miro.com slash podcast. We thank them so much for their support of this week in tech. Let's move to social media. Uh, Blue Sky just went public this week. Now, I probably should explain what Blue Sky is. You all know Twitter, which has now become Elon Musk's personal health site, x.com. Although, who is it that's still on Twitter? You're still on Twitter. Oh, I haven't killed the account, but I don't participate. Nicholas, you I'm use Twitter. Yeah. I'm on basically every day. But for me, it was always like sports. It was always like silly to begin with. So, so if you were going to watch the Super Bowl with a social network open, you'd probably keep it open to... to x.com right i wouldn't now not since they killed tweet deck one of the things that drove me off of twitter was they made the site unusable for me and and then the anti-semitism on top of it but they are bringing back uh, tweet deck by the way i saw it uh, i'm not paying you have for, to pay it. for it yeah, yeah no yeah, I, yeah, never mind. um but blue sky is now public enough that this will be an interesting test is it going to be able to support sufficient super bowl uh conversation and the way they do the algorithmic feeds there's reason to think maybe. It's interesting because Blue Sky is, in a sense, the descendant of Twitter, right? It, Jack Dorsey funded it with $15 million. Jack, you know, says, because, well, it's got to be open and federated and all that. But I think really secretly what he was saying and thinking was, we are getting a lot of pressure from government, from Congress, from uh, other parties to moderate what we're doing. It's it's gotten so intense. Wouldn't it be better if we weren't responsible for the content? It wasn't even all that secret about it. I mean, I think he was fairly, pretty blatant. For, fairly well, forthright about yeah. that. Actually, so, this is really Mike Masnick, who wrote the Protocols Not Platforms love that. Uh, paper. Yes. And the point that he was basically making is that a lot of this functionality that we're enjoying in terms of microblogging is something that is basically a protocol, that you post something yes. and that so systems elsewhere on the internet know how to handle and interact with the message that you've just put out and you've got the tools to be able to collect and interact with the messages other people put out. But you don't really need a private a private garden um, in order to have that functionality. This is functionality that could be supported by general protocols. The way email is a, messages get put out and are handled by separate applications that just recognize the protocol, the way news groups used to work and this idea that we should really just get away from this kind of one company rules the entire community, you don't need that to support the basic communication process. Right. So Mike wrote that paper, Jack liked the paper, Jack kicked in some money, but I think Jack has lost interest because he's changed. Well, well Jack also saw that uh, there were problems with it because a centralized site is how you make money with advertising and a, and a decentralized site all of a sudden breaks you, that apart, but it does solve the problem of moderation and pressure from government. So he funded it with $15 million. Even after Elon bought Twitter, he wasn't able to stop the advance. The Blue Sky folks worked on a third, on a federated protocol they called AT Proto, which is different from the activity pub protocol that Mastodon and other Fediverse sites use. That's kind of sort of a issue for me because I, I'm a Mastodon supporter and it, it would be nice if it would if there were a single protocol that everything would support. I think the issue is they may be able to interact uh, at some point in the future. So, some I mean, they're not incompatible. They're just I, different. Uh, yeah. yeah, I talked to Jay Graber, um, the CEO of Blue Sky, and she said she's at least contemplating Opening the idea it, yeah. of some sort of compatibility between It's protocols. come down to, at this point, Meta's Threads, which has a big user base because they just took everybody from Instagram. Blue Sky and X is still around. Those are yeah, those are kind of the the three. Then there's stuff like TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram. There are other social sites. But for microblogging, the three, I think, are at this point, we can ignore the rest, right? Some have already gone out of business. But Blue Sky, Threads, 
and Twitter, right? Well, and you're, you're, you're calling Mastodon not. Part oh, of the oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Mastodon. Yeah. I love Mastodon. I forgot Mastodon. I mean, I think Mastodon's good. adoption was stymied in part that Blue Sky came out so quickly on the heels of it and that there were certain design choices that had gone into the original deployment of Mastodon that may not have been conducive for all the adoption. Like, I really don't like the lack of, quote, tweets, and that keeps me from engaging with it right. as much. And I ended up on blue sky and spending more time on blue it sky. wasn't a twitter equivalent never has been and really is also much more geeky and i think the conversations are better i prefer mastodon so i've been looking at blue sky though i've been on blue sky for a long time this is a uh, uh, deck dot blue which is a third party implementation that looks just like tweet deck mm -hmm. and in fact there is a suit they made a super bowl feed so uh but what's funny is most of the people on blue sky are definitely not into sports so the super bowl <laughs> feed tends to be more like joking around about how silly the Super Bowl so is. So they're all posting superb owls? Yeah, a lot of superb owl uh, jokes. Um, even though the game is just hours away, there's not a lot of real conversation. I bet you if I go back to Twitter, that's the place to be. If, if you still, if you want to uh, follow Super Bowl or the Academy Awards or any live event. I mean, I, th I think it'll change. Um, I mean, Mastodon might be good if you just look for the hashtags. I think one of the things is that, okay, on on Blue Sky right now, you have people who are not inclined to talk about the Super Bowl hours before the Super Bowl, but you may have a lot of people inclined to talk about the Super Bowl while it's actually happening. Yeah, I'm going to watch. I actually set it up just so I could watch that. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. Pat I, McAfee. Oh, that's a bot. Okay. I used, um, I started with uh, Deck Blue as of yesterday. Liked it a lot, <laughs> except it doesn't, I like to be as thorough as possible. Like I, if I missed tweets i want to go back and see as many as i can and it seems to cut off and i couldn't go that deep back in the chronology actually which made you know me what sad. mastodon is a better place to follow the super bowl <laughs> there's actually <laughs> there's a superb owl but there's actually some uh, some sports content as we get uh, closer to the the deadline so uh, and maybe one dog that had a little bit too much to drink um is there room for does it even make sense to have more than one of these I mean, isn't wasn't the advantage of Twitter? Isn't the reason you're still there, Nicholas? That it's one place. Yeah. Well, I was, that's one of the annoying things of right now, right this moment, because I've got colleagues that are on Threads. You know, people still on X, people on Mass. So if I want to get like a whole day's worth of commentary, I got to look across all these different platforms, which is exhausting, and I really don't even want to do it half the time. You know, a few years ago, everyone was on Twitter, and that was great. So that's a, that's a real uh, negative development. Uh, from all of this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I honestly, I find myself just losing interest in social media. I think I said the last time I was on here where it's just like all this, there's a lot of nonsense on there. And I don't, I, you know, I'm getting older. I don't really, I don't, I don't need to subject myself to some of the silly tweets and so forth. It's interesting. I'm uh, looking at so. the Super Bowl hashtag on uh, Twitter. And one of the things that Twitter still has is the brands. There's the Kansas City Chiefs. There's the San Francisco yeah. 49ers. Uh, the networks are there, uh, you know, NFL on CBS. This is definitely the place. That's what I'm looking to have brands to change. Are. I really do not like. It's a shame. I mean, this is an anti People financially platform. supporting yeah. um, people who want to hurt other people, and right. it, it's a lot a of the sports problem. reporters are still on X. You know, if you if you need breaking news from it's you know place from, to go. From politics, yeah. it's and still there. Yeah, and, and like, so, like, I mean. Thread says they don't want to even like encourage people to talk about politics right, right. at all, just be, well, because that's such a problem. If you're one of the biggest issues on it. Threads is they consider climate change to be political, and so there's no climate change content on Threads either. Um, yeah, that's that's a little bit heavy handed from the point of view of of a user. But to, to Nicholas's point, I think this is a blip uh, with growing pains in it, and I think the fact that Blue Sky has just gone public. Um, you know, give it two months and we may be starting to see more of a convergence because one of the things of, oh yeah, right now we're all split. I don't think we're going to have to remain split that much. I think some of the reason we have a split is that Mastodon wasn't enough of a substitute for Twitter. So a lot of people didn't go over and then Blue Sky might have been, but people couldn't go over because the, the, the invites was really a, a bottleneck. That is gone. And so I think some of this is, Blue Sky is going to swallow up more users. I mean, it grew by more than a million in over and under a week. Um, and I think ultimately with the open protocols, 
you don't necessarily need the convergence because the whole point of having the protocols is that the information is getting out there and you can have some tools that help the information get out there and other tools that help aggregate it. So they that have you, an API. I mean, I could yeah. write a client if I wanted to. And you could. You could write a client that's yeah. looking at, I don't know if you can look at Twitter anymore, but you can look at Mastodon and you can look at Blue Sky and you can unite them into right. one interactive experience and, and then they can push back to their respective communities as long as they're using the API. The fact that a million people joined Blue Sky within a few days of it going public tells me there is a hunger still. Mm -hmm. That's That was almost, that's the real question is, do people even want a, a, a site, a microblog? And in theory, um, you may be able to use threads and Mastodon from one place quite soon. Right. Because... Yeah, I can already uh, follow... Uh, Meta seems to be working on Adam that. Adam on right. my Mastodon. It's, it's just like a couple of uh, people who, who work at uh, Meta right now you can follow. But if they open that up, then... Um, to me, that's I, huge. It's I funny, there so. are some Mastodon folks... Uh, administrators say, "I will, I will right. block <laughs> threads." It's forever. kind of kind of like when AOL opened up to the yeah. internet, and the internet wasn't so thrilled about that More idea. More is better. Uh, More people's better. I think so. And, and if you don't want to follow Adam, you don't have to. Right. You but can the be, fact that you yeah. can, you can be on a, a Mastodon instance that blocks um, threads if you want to. You can okay. even do that. Yeah, you can even let the administrator. Can make I that spew decision. an old joke um, from the '90s? People who think AOL is the internet are the same people who think Taco Bell is fine Mexican cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Adam Masseri, the the, the uh, formerly uh, from Instagram, now at uh, Threads for Meta, and his address is at Masseri at Threads.net, but it is a Mastodon compatible address, and and his posts are here. I would love to see this become more widespread. Then a brand might say. You know, I know Elon's not going to let CBS have uh, somehow share its Twitter feed, but a brand might say, well, if I put it on the Fediverse, at least I'm getting to threads. The brands need to think about why they went on Twitter in the first place. People were complaining about them and they realized they did not want the public complaints to go unanswered. So right. they built the infrastructure to respond. I'm still... going on Blue Sky and complaining about companies. I think they should come and make sure that like I don't they can answer that and that I don't just I'm public. I mean, it started with Comcast Cares, right, Frank? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah he uh, he re started responding to to people complaining about Comcast, and it was phenomenal success. I got much better customer service from just about every business I interact with on Twitter than via any other. Is it still the case? Do you think Twitter has that? Uh, it might be because they're there, but I'm not there, so I'm not tweeting right. at, angry at them. I will say I. I, I was tweeting about Amazon, like, it was like, oh, great, you know, they delivered it very quickly. And Amazon's like, Amazon cares, like, how could we help? They're right so on they're it. They're definitely yeah. immediately on it. And I was like, no, guys, I was giving you credit. And the, they were like, oh, okay, we'll the, just check it. The, <laughs> the one issue which is going to slow that down is that could be backed up with the direct message uh, apparatus, which does not exist for Blue Sky. Although, really, it's kind of crap on Twitter anyway, because they're not particularly private Messages. I'd prefer that you didn't have it. If you couldn't do it right, that you wouldn't have it at all. Yeah, right? I, I, don't, I don't want a, a crappy program as a right. pro that people think is private. Um, I mean, because now the problem is, is pri what I mean that they're not private is that Elon can read all of them and this may not be a good thing. <laughs> um, but you, pr so with open protocols though, in theory, you can have a spinoff, like we can have WhatsApp or Signal or some sort of encrypted uh, mechanism that in theory, the, um, you know, the, the microblogging platform could interact with some other way of launching a secure channel between identity to identity. Like there's ways of solving the problem, but right now it's painful because we haven't solved the problem. Do we need, so, but uh, back to my fundamental question, do we need to have something? Yeah. There was a lot of benefit to having Twitter as the kind of the nervous system of the internet. Well, I don't think we need something as one thing to rule it all. I think we need to replicate a lot of what we lost, but let's replicate I it in like a way that it's... one thing to rule them all. I mean, I don't, like the, uh, I don't like the fact that one commercial entity controls it, but it is nice to know there's one place you can go to find out if, uh, you know, at, uh, somebody's a celebrity has died or... Uh, what that shaking was or yeah, who just won the Super Bowl. This could be Google well, aggregating. Like you just need something that aggregates in a so way the, that... So Federation could solve that. I, all, all the functionality that Twitter offers is all replicable in some sort of open protocol. Right. We just haven't... We're at the beginning stages of it, so we're missing it because right now it's Twitter which had developed it to a reasonably stable plane and versus we don't... We haven't replicated it yet. Right. But there's no reason why we can't. It would be right. nice if it was more like email, which for many years we've all assumed that you don't need to worry about what 
system somebody else is on, you know you can reach them from your email client. And uh, yeah. that wasn't always true. There was a time where, when if you were on AOL, you could only email other people on AOL. And it would be nice right. if, we, if we got there with this stuff. That's right. 25 we're, years we're, after we're going the email other direction. solved it out. We're going into the silos. But We've the, got out of the silos. Now we're... But, but we're that's what back. protocols, not platforms, are supposed to do to say right. the silos were a wrong turn. Right. Let's go back to what we knew. It was better and more more functional for everybody and something that we obviously works well enough that we can depend on it to a great degree. Yeah, yeah. That was 2019 Mike wrote that. Um as usual, he was pretty prescient and pretty yeah, sensible. Very smart. Well, Blue Sky anyway is open now. If you wanted to, I have six invites that are. I have six invites. No as good. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh, this is you know you only get a few times of the year where you can really experiment and see. So I've got a mastodon set up with uh, the Super Bowl in my second column here, and of course, as absolutely I would expect on mastodon, somebody has tooted. So I found this super bowl on the sidewalk, and I can't be so excited about it. Handmade, <laughs> speckled stoneware in my favorite colors. That is a very mastodon hashtag super bowl. Uh, Deck, Deck Blue uh, also has a second column devoted to the super bowl. It's getting a little more super bowl-y. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm going to use this as an as a opportunity. I guess I'll have Twitter up, too. I don't have a tweet deck anymore, which I agree with you. That that makes me sad. That was the best way to use Twitter. But I can follow the uh, Super Bowl hashtag. And uh, it's very Super bowl -y. They even have, like, betting odds. And, you know, this is where a centralized platform does have... There's something to be said for that, right? There needs to be a reason why we're using a centralized platform. At the moment, it's because... It doesn't. Twitter doesn't have competitors, but Twitter will have competitors, and you think we'll be the opening up of uh, Blue Sky is going to be the beginning? Oh of yeah, that. I yeah. mean, because basically that can be where all the data sits, and you can have any other shell or API or other service. Because um, one of the services that's going to come out is you'll probably have extra layers of moderation, and yes. so whoever you may you may want to pay somebody to help you with the moderation right. problem. But okay, that's also where monetization can come in, where you can make these services more sustainable, that there's a lot of bolt-ons you can do to the basic functionality that either can be ad-supported or people will pay for. Should be. I mean, like Gmail came along 20 years ago and was radically better than any other email client. And, and yes, yet it was also compatible with them. So I don't see why somebody can't build a radically better com uh, client for this stuff, even if it's all based on protocols. It won't be Google, will it? Probably not. It's kind of sad that we've lost that. Yeah. But I think they lost themselves. Well, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But uh, uh, that's a yeah. loss to us. You just can't look. But to it's Google an opportunity for, for somebody else, which, yeah. quite frankly, is almost good for Google. It's better because. Oh no, it's. Better. I mean, it I solves agree. the antitrust problem for Google if yeah. they actually do have competitors. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also better to have a more vibrant ecosystem and not yeah. a few giants controlling everything. Um, what well, actually brings up the question that I keep asking, we've had, uh, once again, the layoffs in the tech industry this year already crossed 25,000 in January. And yet it's pretty clear, at least if you look at the stock market, that uh, they're doing all right. This is from layoffs.fyi, 34,250 employees laid off in the tech sector this year. What's going on? I think a lack of vision. Um, some of this is errors in vision and how they staffed up. So I think some, some of those of it numbers- Some of was staffing up in COVID, right? Well, so. that's what they said. And, um, and there was more of a, there was a perceived lack of talent. So I think some companies were hoarding talent because, mm. oh, we can hire a good person, so let's just hire this them. This is gonna be, we don't have but, anything for them. But I yeah. think in the, what concerns me more is the companies that have closed down certain departments and switch their focus to other departments. Now, some of that number means that there's jobs that are going, that are empty, that need filling. So some of the 34,000 may have been swallowed up internally, that technically they were laid off, but they may actually roll over into other jobs. But I worry with the, la with the change of direction of some of these companies, because I'm afraid that they abandoned um, technologies or services that may be more beneficial and sustainable in the long term and they're putting stuff that's more flash in the panty and maybe not good for them to be investing quite so much in i'm thinking in particular of some of the ai bets that people are making of like could you please do what you were doing so well originally before you can find the extra to do you know give me accurate data google before you start creating tools that will hallucinate data 
that's a fundamental change in the company's direction and mission. And if that's the way they want to make their resource bets, I think we're all in trouble as people who kind of depend on Google to give us good information. Harry, do you follow this uh, story? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of them are, are more or less boasting that they're doing this in order to p- make bigger bets on AI. They, they don't like they don't uh, they don't see the flip side that maybe they're chasing after AI in a, in a way that is a, a little bit faddish. Um, do you, you don't think AI is going to produce the results that they expect? I, I think AI, AI will be will be transformative and will be very useful, but we're still in the process of figuring out exactly how. And so some of the specific things people are doing are a little bit faddish. I, I don't think that AI is going to go away in the way that the metaverse or th- Web3 was exciting for six months. No, I, so I think that's the right that. way. Yeah. The fat investments in faddish things is not good corporate stewardship, and it does make me concerned, and it makes but, me worry that the stock market will catch up to that when the reality of those decisions catch up. Of course, it's the stock market that's making them do it in the first place. Making, I'm right? not quite sure. Well, the incentive is, they, you want your price to go up? You better follow the latest trend. If they didn't do it, the stock would hurt. Microsoft, look at my, Microsoft's stock has done, actually, look what Meta's stock has done. Uh, the market rewards you for being following the fad. Well, I mean, it's... But uh, only temporarily. You're right. At some point, they'll punish you. Temporarily, and I think we're going off. through a very dark time of some issues that are coming to the fore about corporate governance and board independence. Um, Twitter, all the Musk stuff is a complete disaster in that regard, but I don't think yeah, it's... Elon, compl- Elon's boards are always his cronies. I mean, to a really almost pathological and <laughs> degree that is not really supposed to be what corporate law supports. You're right. supposed to have independence. But I think we're looking at a lot of other boards, even outside of the Musk examples, where they may be quite captured. They are either structured in a way where they can't do much, and there's pluses and minuses for why companies got set up that way. But I think they're kind of captured. Or then you get pirates and stuff like that. Like, I think we have to tune corporate law if we want to make sure that these companies are sustainable and producing sustainable, beneficial innovation. And right now we're really not set up with that. And we're starting to see the tension show up in other areas of law that are a bit new for us. Like 25 years ago, we had the dot bomb crash and and which essentially the the internet economy collapsed. And that did not mean the internet was going away. In fact, the internet boomed uh, in a bigger way than ever. So I think it, it's possible for something both to be a bubble and to be really important. And my general sense is just as the internet stopped being a separate thing 25 years ago, AI will essentially be something that's just everywhere and part of the oxygen we breathe. And we, we probably won't talk about AI as much at some point just because it is everywhere. And you, you assume that anything that involves software probably has a dollop of AI to it. How are you on uh, AI these days, Nicholas? We haven't talked since the AI boom. Yeah, no, I feel like I personally have cooled off a little bit in the past year. Uh, you know, ChatGPT and Bard, I guess now Gemini. You know, I was using them for a little while, uh, help cooking. Uh, but so honestly, the hallucination stuff became annoying. I was doing some research for a home theater and I was asking Bard to compare receivers and it was just giving me just false information. So I was like, well, this is like, what is the point of this? Uh, and I, I know someone who owns a small business and they use ChatGPT to help draft blog posts. So that's that's a useful, mm-hmm. like a useful you know, thing. But for, again, for the average person, our readership, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the the great concern is oh they're gonna use Bing and they're gonna they're gonna stop using Google because it'll give some you know summar, summarizations. I know the Arc browser, they're starting to do some AI generated stuff there as well, which has proved to be controversial, I believe. So I don't know. I'm I'm more wait and see. I feel like a year ago I was like, Well, this is clearly the future, this is awesome, here we go. Now I'm like I don't, I don't really know that I've seen anything too compelling, you know, not to write off the entire sector. Obviously, that would be silly, uh, but I'm I'm more wait and see than I was a year ago. Yeah, it's funny because we were talking before the show. I've been more convinced of the value of AI when you give it a corpus that you control and say, follow this. Like if you could give it uh, every uh, Consumer Reports issue and every Wirecutter issue and every Ratings.com issue and then ask it questions about consumer electronics, it would be, and say, stick to what you, stick to what I just gave you. It would be useful, it wouldn't be hallucinating. I really feel like um, it's, that's part of the process is we're gonna understand what it's good for, what it's not good for. 
I speaking of the Arc browser, I become a big fan of the Arc browser. I use it exclusively. I wish I could use it on my Linux machine here, but it's written in Swift, so it's really a, a Mac product and secondarily a window product. But they use uh, a uh, AI company called Perplexity, um, yeah. and the perplex they ha actually actually have been using this a lot. The perplex the Perplexity um, add-in will summarize pages for you. And then what they've also done, which is, this is the controversy, is on the uh, iPhone, they have an arc. It's iPhone, you know, this is interesting because Apple sort of created this problem, which is that every browser has to be based on WebKit. That's going to change soon in the EU. But right now, every browser has to be based on WebKit. So if Arc wants to do a browser on, on iOS, it's hard to add, say, what's the value add? So what they said is, well, what if we did this? I mean, yeah, it's a browser, but really the, the front end is an AI where you say, tell me uh, what the best receiver would be to get in 2024. And then, and this is where it's controversial, it makes a button that says, uh, create a page for me. I can't remember what it says. It says, but browse for me. Browse I think for says. me. Yeah. And then it creates a page for you that is the the... The summary of what all these other web pages are saying, but not the web pages. There is a link there, but honestly, and this is where maybe I, my goals vary from Consumer Reports and other websites' goals. I find that very useful. That's what I want on an iPhone. I don't want to browse on an iPhone. It's too small a screen. I'll browse on the desktop. I don't go to websites. I don't want to go to websites in Safari. What I want to do is summarize information. Have you, it sounds like you've used it. I've used it. Yes, I was. I mean, I, I. Uh I've loved Arc in the past. This, the, I'm a little scared about this, uh, partially because it is really well done. It's it also does it way more quickly than it I scratches than I my expected. Itch. Yeah, uh, it works really fast. And I, I, it did occur to me that maybe at some point, companies that are creating useful content should think about blocking these things. Which and if if all of them blocked Arc, then um, Arc would have a problem rather than the companies that create the useful stuff it's scraping having the problem. But on the other hand. <laughs> and I'm very bullish on AI now. All of a sudden, I, I've got somehow converted. If companies start blocking AI, you're, you're going to kill AI because AI re depends on this is true. the I mean, corpus of knowledge that it can absorb. And so if people start saying, well, it's copyright, you can't have it. If, if AI is, as, as uh, Sam Allman has said, if AI is only trained on public domain material, it's not going to be very useful or well, very are, good. I mean, there are alternatives like um, like paying the people who create this useful information for putting it into your uh, LLM. Mm, yeah, I, you, I think that's what the New York Times is looking for, right? Is Kathy shaking licensor. her head. Yeah, that's no, I, I'm all, we, I think we discussed it on a twig. Um, I think there is no sustainable compulsory licenses compulsory licensing system that would work, but I think this idea that... Why not? We have one for music. Uh, that is incredibly dysfunctional, and I would not call it anything that we should. I mean, compulsory licensing systems in general are nice. The way in it works theory, in music, but they, but they're they all they do is they move the transaction costs, and they don't actually get rid of the transaction. So, costs. in music, if I want to sample your song, you wrote a song, and I want to sample it. You can't stop me, but I have to pay you a compulsory fee. I mean, in some because there's a, there's a number of layers here. Do I have the right? to say no to you. If I have the right to say no to you, the compulsory licensing system will basically takes take away, away my right to say yeah. no. It just takes away my right to say no and brokers the transaction so I get something and that's an exchange for my yes. So we don't have to negotiate that. If you right. if you want me to say yes, you don't have to have a separate transaction right. because the, the terms have already been decided. Those Academically, those are nice systems in some context, but the, the details of setting them up right. um, just so move the transaction costs. AI. But the other problem is, is it presumes that the authors have the right to say no. And what right. we discussed on the other show was the right, the, to, read. the right to read. Normally, an author does not have the right to say no to somebody reading their book, using a tool to read their book. So why should their software not be you able to read You taught me that that's a First Amendment I, protection. Because the right to read is incorporated in the First Amendment. And yeah. I, I to use copyright law to stop that. Uh, changes copyright law and expands it beyond what it, what the statute says and what I think the statute could possibly say under the I mean, I'm sympathetic movie. to Harry and, and, and to Nicholas who create content. They put it on the web. That's how they make their living. Uh, and then along comes somebody who says, I have the right to read. It turns out to be a machine 
that to chews it up, digests it, and then spits it out so people don't but have to read your Google content. that's what Google has done. I mean... Well, they did it with snippets. This is... No, no. I mean, but they scan the web. They're reading the stuff. Well, you, you have, have to do a search engine. Yeah, but you have just as much copyright in what you put on, on your blog post that you would in your book or your article. I mean, I was thinking more specifically about ARC and more specifically about, like, technical solutions like we have for web crawling, where it's possible yeah. to say, web crawler... Well, they do Don't that. crawl me. I don't know if you saw um, the story that robots.txt, which can be used to block AI, is widely yeah. used by most media sites, except for right-wing right. media sites, who are happy to get that spread. And that is a, a tiny, tiny part of That's whatever whatever solution might exist. I mean, yeah. I think I made the point to Paris on the other show that like you should be so lucky to be um, put used to train because I don't know if you're Paris feels that way. Well, she nodded, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you but, should feel so lucky, Harry. Because because you're contributing to uh, it's good for you're society. Part the, you're part of the lex lexicology yes. of of the public, and you're you don't want to be excluded from that because if the if you're building a technology that's going to try to learn language to replicate language the way the human mind does, you kind of want to not be excluded from that because your language enriches. I mean, in theory, if it enriches any reader, it would enrich any reader, whether they're biological or artificial. Personally, I agree. And I, I, I mean, the various things I've written on my own sites, I do not plan to block. But there are these media companies that need to have a business model that works. And if, if nobody has, if somebody else is taking that knowledge and there's no reason to visit the media sites, I mean, the whole system breaks down and, and ARC won't have anything to scrape at some point if there's no way for these companies to make money. And as a user, I love the Browse For Me button. It's I very, use it all the time. That's what I want. I want quite information. Ingenious. I don't, I'm not interested in going to websites. I, also I just want some knowledge. I also have not seen it hallucinate, maybe because it's going to these yeah. specific sites. It's a really, it's a better search engine. It's, I think it's using, I know it's using perplexity.ai. I actually ended up paying for perplexity because I was impressed. Uh, Perplexity definitely hallucinates. Oh, yeah. Um, they all do, right? I've been They're... using Gemini Advanced from Google, which hallucinates. I think some of the problem with this conversation, though, not this particular conversation, this is a very erudite conversation and everyone should envy us. But um, I think in general with the, uh, the overall... <laughs> That's what I say, <laughs> yeah, yes. With the overall discussion of AI is this is really a marketing term and this is, and it getting applied in a whole bunch of technologies and a whole bunch of applications and it tends to be used as a synonym for magic wand and i that can't possibly be how we understand the innovation or how we understand the law around the innovation or how we really understand what is we're innovating and how we're going to use it so a lot of this needs to be broken down into what are we talking about and a lot of things caught under the whole ai mark buzzword marketing term um are a whole bunch of discrete things some of this is just really sophisticated software that has a capability of processing data on a scale that we haven't seen before, um, making some inferences based on the ed the data that it's processing. And to the extent that it delivers us more control over how we wanted to apply our tools to our problems, that's great. But I'm not entirely sure that's necessarily full bore, you know, commander data, artificial intelligence. Now, other people are really trying to work on building uh, a commander data. I think we are a lot further from it than anybody is talking about, but that's also where you need the greatest training ability because you're not going to get commander data if all you could do is read 20 books at a time um, or only some books or some libraries. Uh, you know, imagine what he'd say if he only had Wikipedia to train him up. So in those sense, if we're going to shoot for a commander data, we do have to understand what needs to be available to make that system work. But I think we're so far from it and a lot of the problems we're having, technology problems, usability problems, policy problems, are we are acting as if we have commander data to deploy to a whole bunch of uh, problems. We don't have a commander data to deploy on any of our problems and we're nowhere near it and it's about time we face that reality. And then just take in hand what we do have and what problems we do have and what technologies we have to solve them. And what Leo was talking about with the corpus, I think is really important, where I think one of the fundamental things we've lost sight about is that innovation should help us have control over our own lives. And I think a lot of the problems we're having is that innovation is causing us to abdicate and abandon control over our lives and put in the hands of people making inferences that may not be supportable. Good point. Rant, rant. No, I, I don't think you're wrong, yeah. but I still want my browser button. Uh, we're going to take a break. <laughs> we're going to take a break.
this is the problem. People want what people want, right? Even if it's dumb and wrong. I mean, they want zero rating. We, they want a lot of we things. We want Commander Data. I'm not saying we should I want Commander for it, Data. But um, I think we need to recognize he's not available yet. Yeah, so that's given what, you what say. we yeah. <laughs> I got a browse for me button. Okay. It worked. <laughs> all right, that's all you we need. We were we were uh, I was walking uh, hiking in Point Reyes uh, yesterday and I wanted to know where to eat. Now normally I would have probably gone to Yelp or or somewhere like that or search Google. What I did is I uh, actually did uh, on ARC, I said, L lunch spots near Point Razor Rut Lighthouse, browse for me. And it gave me a whole list with a description and stuff. Now, I, it, did, it took this from eight different websites. Uh, it's not hallucinating. It does, in fact, give me below it links. <laughs> but honestly, I got what I wanted in the first five paragraphs. I never went to those sites. Did you, how confident were you it wasn't hallucinating? They're, well, I kind of know the area, so I know they're all real. Okay. Uh, and did it actually seem like good advice rather than just a list yeah. of places that happened to be there? It was exactly what I, we went to a side street kitchen, which offers a variety of American Mediterranean dishes with a high review rating. And it was good. You know, I don't even know if I went to the best place in Point Reyes. I don't care. This, this solved a problem, right? And that's the problem. If it solves a problem, you can go on and on about the right thing or the best thing. But people aren't going to go for that. My, you know? my gonna... point is that it is not solving the problem. But it that's... did. No, in this case, that was fine. But the, that was one technology application. I've that isn't AI writ large. For the last large. three weeks, that's all I've... That is a very... <laughs> I, I validate that particular technology as being something well, carefully tailored to a specific problem. Yeah. But no, that's not AI. That is some specific implementation. Well, that's all humans get to experience is the is an implementation. Yeah, you don't get to experience the behind the scenes I validate dialogue. that implementation, but to just kind of call, oh, AI is wonderful. I mean, not every AI system would have solved your problem. No, they're, they're not designed this for one that. Did. And that isn't magic. That was basically information processing in a way that delivered you yeah. uh, information worked, you knew existed. It worked exactly in a, in a, right. And I've never had anything like that before. So it's it must good. be AI. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. We're going to have more. Kathy Gellis. That's good. Challenge. Challenge yeah. my, uh, my, my thick-headedness. Uh, she's here. She's also joined by Nicholas DeLeon from Consumer Reports and uh, Harry McCracken from Fast Company. Great to have all of you. Our show today brought to you by Collide with a K. What do you call an endpoint security product that works great? Perfectly, but makes users miserable. Well, that's a failure, right? The old approach to endpoint security is to lock down employee devices, to roll out changes through forced restarts, but it just doesn't work. IT's miserable because they got a mountain of support tickets. Hey, what did you do? Employees start using personal devices just to get the work done. You know, that's going to be a nightmare. And executives... Yeah, the ones who sign the checks, they opt out the first time it makes them late for a meeting. You got a problem. You can't have a successful security implementation unless you work with end users. And that's where Collide comes in. Their user-first device trust solution notifies users as soon as it detects an issue on their device. It teaches them how to solve it without needing help from IT. That way, untrusted devices are blocked from authenticating, but users don't have to stay blocked. And your IT department loves it because they're offloaded. And it's great because your users are now part of your team. They're on your side helping to protect your network. Collide is designed for companies with Okta. It works everywhere with macOS, Windows, Linux, mobile devices. doesn't require MDM, so you could put it on BYOD devices. You could put it on anything. If you have Okta and you're looking for a device trust solution that respects your team, you got to visit collide.com slash twit. Watch the demo today. See how it works. K-O-L-I-D-E collide.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of our show this week in tech. I love the AI conversation. It really gets, it really, uh, it's something so new that uh, we just don't have the answers. And it's appropriate. Uh, by the way, it's really appropriate to have that conversation. But I, and I, I'm playing a little bit of a devil's advocate, but I think users, they're not going to think about the ramifications of it. They're just going to say, does it work or doesn't it work? That's why I worry about it being a marketing term because- It kind of is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind having, like, let's have a conversation about that particular piece of software you just used to get useful well, information. Well, it is controversial because that's the people who made that information are not getting compensated in any way. Yeah, but neither- 
Google was searching yeah, the Google web, so they either. could aggregate yeah. it. I mean, Google it's, could actually have been creating a service that does that does what you did. In theory, that's what they. That's what the knowledge graph it was the idea behind the knowledge. Yeah, graph. I mean, I don't know why they're walking away from it from mm -hmm. it at this point. Instead of like indexing the world's they've, information, they've now they're like way. hallucinating. The what is wrong with Google? What's going on at Google? Is it Sundar Pichai's fault? Well, when you come to dominate something. It's a bad in thing, the same way that, that yeah. they do, it's very difficult to, to leap on the next thing because you have this enormous business to protect, um, which in some ways might be kind of good because at least Google s seems somewhat concerned about protecting its reputation for providing useful information. Although, although I'm working on this for my next newsletter, there's, there's this conundrum that if you pay Google $20 a month for the best version of Gemini, you get something that hallucinates less. <laughs> and if you use the free free version, one of the big differences is it hallucinates like crazy. So um, um, it's useless. Presumably more people are using the free version. And, uh, and one reason why it's free is because that's not as good as actually giving you accurate information, which seems very anti-Google-y to me. In, in the past, Google at its best both gave you stuff for free and it was pretty darn reliable. And uh, that, that's not true with Gemini. I'm really concerned about, I mean, obviously a company needs to grow and can't just rest on its laurels, but I think the term you use, faddish, this seems like, ooh, shiny object is chasing that. And at the potential, uh, I mean, they just closed down Google Cash and I'm worried about what other services they're either not going to support or not rebooting like Reader or something like that. And I don't see a guiding principle for this is what the company is. This is what we're about. This is what we're good at. Start here. And then, okay, we can experiment and build out and see what the next things are doing. Quite frankly, our earlier conversation about Vision Pro almost looks like Apple doing that, which is we've got some core competencies, but now we're going to push the envelope a little later, uh, a little further to unite those core competencies. It seems a little less shiny object, but would seem very shiny object if it was just a pure VR machine. Burden is on you, Nicholas, to communicate to normal people what's going on, and what the yeah. potential problems are. How Are you able to do that effectively, you think? It's, I feel like a lot of this stuff is just not on average folks' radar. They're not even thinking uh, about it. Your, no, to your point a second ago of you know, using you know, search for me and I got good restaurants. Okay, that that's that's great and that's going to be useful. Uh, but, you know, just go down a couple notches down the line and it's like, okay, well, if all the local websites are, aren't are making money off that content, then five years from now, when you search, search for me, there's not going to be anything there because all those sites are out of business. Uh, but that's not, that's not the concern of the consumer today. They're going to see well, shiny thing that's cool. Let me throw in a so, monkey wrench because the content yeah. on many of those sites was generated by us as users, like Yelp. Mm -hmm. Yelp only is a platform for our reviews. Would, so isn't it full yeah. circle? It's just, yeah, you know, well, we're disintermediating Yelp. Reports, you know, obviously we have, you know, hundreds of employees. I don't know offhand how many, but uh, tons of testers. Yeah, you create your own content. Folks yeah, who yeah. are literally, you know, looking at refrigerators and cars and laptops and routers in my case and doing the work and creating the content and publishing that. And hopefully some percentage of people will pay for that. That keeps the lights on. Long time uh, member, the most part. More, than, more than three uh, decades. And if, that, <laughs> if, if ARC is just going to summarize that and right. then like we, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to contribute to the corpus of humanity, but that doesn't necessarily pay my rent or pay my mortgage well, or whatever the case may be. Consumer Reports is mostly behind a paywall. So you can see some stuff for free. I presume that AI yeah. is not getting to the stuff behind the paywall, right? The way it, the way it works to to my, I mean, I may even be wrong here, but the, the ratings, like the actual data, is behind the paywall. Yeah, you have so to if be you a want member. To see, yeah. What does Toyota Corolla get? You know, right. that's behind the paywall. But the actual articles, like the kind of stuff that we, oh, iPhone preview, uh, uh, any any sort of, that's uh, ahead of the paywall, and that's more or less just an an ad to get you to right. to subscribe to the magazine. I so, think it, it gives you the general idea. I know because yes. I'm a longtime subscriber. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if but if I'm not subscribed in on the browser, which I'm often not, because uh, I only check it, you know, when I'm about to buy something. Uh, you sure. see this summary, and then I go, oh, gosh, I'm going to log in. I want to see the ratings. If the AI doesn't get the ratings, you're protected. Your content is somewhat protected, yes. But if I can channel um, Jeff here. Um, the, the Jeff Jarvis Jeff of Jarvis Twig. Of Twig. Jarvis. Um, Moral panic, man. Well, the, the <laughs> economics of media are under strain, but they're under strain for reasons that have nothing to do with, with AI. They have, right. they're, as 
I think he very correctly notes, they are under strain from a variety of reasons and some of which are completely avoidable and involve uh, incumbents making really bad bets and not responding to users and understanding how audiences shifted to digital and leaving money on the table, not adopting innovation, being hostile to innovation that could have created markets and market opportunities. And sometimes you're seeing successes from upstart businesses that have not made those mistakes. Right. So the point of, okay, we have to, you know, make sure that people can continue to fund the ability to create more works is valid. But, um, but the reflex to just blame the tech is not good because it's a much more complex problem with that, including causes that have absolutely nothing to do with the tech. And if we hadn't stood in the way of the tech might have actually produced solutions that would have help things be more sustainable. And we're kind of screwed at this point anyway, because um, I mean, his he makes the point that like just the capitalist interest, I, well, I hate to sound quite that, um, he doesn't phrase it that way either, but um, but just sort of this idea that like, well, we're what people have done to media just by treating it as an investment asset, as opposed to a sustainable media business is, seems to be the culprit for an awful lot of avoidable failures. There's also a risk. Uh, here is uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, being quoted by uh, Bloomberg. It's an opinion piece. But on Thursday, Mark Zuckerberg said, the next key part of our playbook is learning from unique data and feedback loops in our products, italicized in our products, Facebook, Instagram. He says there are hundreds of billions of publicly shared images, tens of billions of public videos. He says that's bigger than the common crawl database. So... If you say, well, we, uh, we're not going to let AI look at these websites, suddenly Mark Zuckerberg has a huge advantage because he's created a site 20 years ago. And by the way, happy 20th anniversary, Facebook. Uh, he created a site 20 years ago, which somehow he got everyone to put everything they know in there. Now he's got a huge corpus of information. And it's, 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 and it's much closer to being a walled garden than most other parts right. of the Right. No one else is training on it. Uh, like, I mean, think, there actually is a lot of great stuff in Facebook groups, but it's not crawled by Google. So you're not going to find that in, unless you go to Facebook. So it, um, I actually brought, I, I quit Facebook years ago and I, I had to recreate a Facebook account because of that. You can't see what's going on inside of Facebook unless you're in Facebook. Instagram seems a little bit more ex exposed to the, the uh, internet, but it still is somewhat it's, walled off. It's, uh, I never see anything on Instagram because I don't have an Instagram account. And so I'm constantly stopped at the front door and I have no idea what's right. behind it. You're not missing anything. Mm. That's right. I mean, you in order to re uh, read stuff on Facebook, you need to be logged into Facebook. Right. Okay. Although it's interesting. Mark's very good at that. Mark has, and, and now he has a huge advantage. But that was also sort of a byproduct of users and privacy arguments. Because in theory, stuff in Facebook could be more public and people kind of freaked out because they didn't think that when they were posting, right, they were posting in, yeah, yeah. in that sort of public context. Book. And Facebook's yeah. controversy has been people having the perception of private when it actually was very public. But this public. points back to the irony that I started with, which is the many companies, Twitter, Yelp, Facebook, are only valuable because of the content we as users put in there. So what are their rights to that? And why shouldn't AI be allowed to train on that? Um, we get, we already gave it away by posting on those sites. Well, we probably haven't, we haven't given title, I don't think. I haven't read all well, the that's TOS. A but, that's illegal. But, 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 but all the TOS, all the terms of service yeah, yeah. that nobody bothers to read, were probably written yeah, once not, they got competent lawyers involved in a way that basically reserved the right they to do it. this stuff. I understand they yeah. legally own it, but morally, I don't see a problem with AI skimming it because after all, it's yeah. our content that we put up there freely. Yeah. Well, they don't legally own it. They have the they have the Whatever license. They have but the license to use it for themselves. Yeah, which is different than them owning it. And no, it's they have, also and they have the right yeah. to block AI. I understand yeah. they're going to be able to do that. It, but I do I do think there's a little bit of an, a moral irony there, that it is our content. I mean, this is what has always bugged me about Twitter, was they act as if they are the that this is their proprietary stuff. It isn't. All they did is make I will it possible jump in to post. With with Twitter, in regards to paying, I, to me, one of the 
nothing has really destroyed Twitter more than paying people because then it just became a race to get like right. popular tweets. And you saw the, I mean, whatever the level of discourse on Twitter ever was, but like uh, you saw it just decline dramatic because people are just trying to like get today's winning home run or whatever. And as someone who's kind of stuck around when a lot of my colleagues have left, because again, like I said, there's still a lot of sports reporters and, and video game stuff on there that I still find useful. Uh, the, the, the paying people perversely made the site worse. Well, I, th I I would argue that's what's happened to YouTube too. That the incentives, the pers the perverse incentives on YouTube, have created a whole cadre of quote journalists whose really only desire is to get your clicks and your views. I don't understand. As a policy advocate, a lot of YouTube's decisions have really just driven me crazy. Well, but it's because, good business. Well, I. Th no, I'm not sure it is because it changes my argument. I've made arguments. I remember making one at a copyright office hearing for uh, the DMCA. And I made a point that, you know, if I post, it was about a song that I had written. And I, 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 I talked about how, look, nobody's going to give me a, a record contract here. But if I can put it on YouTube and make five, you know, a nickel out of a play, that's five cents more than I would ever make before we got these sort of intermediaries that help us do the self-expression. And then Google changed its model. So like, if you're really small, you don't get your nickel. And <laughs> um, and I think that changes the policy argument. And I think it's also changed the site because- But that's the, that's the power that these guys have, right? Little decisions, huge lever. And I think just, I don't understand either the motivation, but- even if I understood the motivation, I'm really dubious that they thought about this carefully enough. Yeah, probably. To re I, I mean, in terms of where did it leave the policy advocacy? Because I think it hurt them. I think they'd have a much stronger position when regulators want to do stupid things to YouTube if they could say, look, we are helping people talk. We're helping people monetize. That goes you a could, long way. You could almost, uh, I think, predict the cycle, the hype cycle that you would see on YouTube, on Vision Pro, you know, initially you'll get a lot of pro stuff and then look at this number one in the recommendations. I was wrong, guy, wearing, apparently wearing a Vision Pro in a shower because that's always yes. a good way to promote VR. I survived 50 hours in Apple Vision Pro. This changes everything. And of course, you've got to have the the uh, weird expression. How many do you have to scroll before there's a woman? Oh, there's a woman reading in Apple Vision Pro okay. for 24 hours. It's a woman, but it's another freak show, yeah. right? A lot of this is freak show. Um, okay, maybe I feel better that there weren't as many women. Yeah. They're not the freaks. <laughs> Beware the Vision Brothers. Now we know that most of the videos we've seen this is this is this is Inception. This is Ouroboros. This is YouTube eating its own tail. CNET has posted a video about people who are trying to get clicks on YouTube. By doing dumb things wearing Vision Pro, many cases faked situations. So she's doing a story on how bad that is. So this is like, I mean, it's crazy. And I think this the problem is this pollutes the conversation. This is this is where all the content's going. And that's a perfect example of how, because it's so huge, YouTube has this disproportionate, they can make a little move and it has this disproportionate effect on, on not just the uh, the people who publish there, but the users and ultimately all of us. I think there were reasons of why <laughs> they um, they turned off the small users. I mean, there are some obviously some costs involved to pay out on the nickel is expensive, but I don't think they did it for that. I think they were I think they did it as a moderation solution to a problem that had started to emerge, but it doesn't seem to have solved the moderation <laughs> problem. It seems to have exacerbated it because it's and made it that all of the right. it. it there's an expression like the long tail of like right. the independent people. There is people. no long tail anymore. Right. It's not serving the long tail right. and it's created incentives where everybody is now bending over backwards and doing really crappy things where it's not really the merits of their message that are, it's all the logarithmic um, exponential growth as opposed to sort of a more, you know, marketplace of ideas. What is the, you know, what is the correct remuneration for um, this particular idea or this particular piece of media that you've put in the public consciousness? Do you worry, Harry, that big tech is too powerful? Sure, but that's been a big problem for a really long time. Yeah, but they're uh, not getting less powerful. They're not getting less powerful. Um, they're still, I mean, open AI coming along and being a really small company that invented something the big guys couldn't in some ways I find somewhat encouraging. But then they got immediately swallowed by Microsoft. Right. My, yeah, Microsoft plays an incredibly important role in that. Um, 
But part I, of the, by the way, that's one of the kind of the the problems of AI is that it is really really expensive to make the uh, LLM models. Yes, I mean that part of why um, Google and OpenAI want twenty dollars for their really good models is because it costs a lot to run them. It's not entirely clear whether they're really great at businesses yet, or if anybody has figured out how to make them into great businesses. Um, it's kind of almost a typical t Silicon Valley scenario, which is you're going to lose money, but you're going to make it up in volume, you know? <laughs> I think over, presumably over time they will figure this out, but it is short-term a challenge, and um, it's part of why these kind of crummy LLMs are the ones you can get for free. Right, right. All right, I want to take a little break. Lots more to talk about. Nicholas de Leon, Consumer Reports. You feel, I feel like you, you, you're, you're, a tree grows in Brooklyn, but now you've moved to the Pacific, um, not the Pacific, but the Southwest, and you're really, you've, you've put down roots. I feel like you belong there now, Nicholas. I, I like it a lot. Uh, like nice. I said, I'm born and raised in New York. Uh, New York is fine, but this is, this is all new and exciting to me. Like I'm right by the Santa Catalina Mountains. Nice. Uh, and there's snow capped. I've never seen snow capped mountains, <laughs> certainly not growing up. I mean, maybe here or there, but like that's my backyard now. That's incredible to me. It's, uh, and, and it's and blazing I, it's hot down in the on, on ground level and it's and it's snow in the mountains yeah. but yeah. he used to have it's snow on his doorstep <laughs> yeah well no more so thank god <laughs> no more of that <laughs> it's funny though all the ai discussion and i'm like i just want to go for a hike i don't know let 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 open ai sort all the stuff out and i'll i'll come back tomorrow oh see nicholas how it shakes out that's where i am too it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah, ah, yeah. screw it yeah let's yeah. just you know we'll see what happens but after all don't we kind of kind of put our fingers in the gears here because at some point it's going to be unstoppable i almost feel like that's the problem with big tech it's it is now too big to stop like we're so dependent on it yeah. You, you, there's nothing you could do about it. I don't. I don't know. I think well, I get more frustrated by how we are trying to stop it because it tends well, to be. Too. It tends to be exactly what you don't want to have happen. It it emphasizes the worst right. and suppresses the best. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> what a great world we. Let's go for a hike, Nicholas. What do you say? Yeah, I think. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> be a lot less frustrating. Our show today yes. brought to you by NetSuite. Once your business gets to a certain size the cracks start to emerge and there suddenly there are just too many manual processes to keep track of. Now, if this is where you are in your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25 and one. Maybe I better explain 37,000. That's the number of businesses who have upgraded a NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, HR and more. All right. Well, what about 25? Well, I'll tell you, 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. Okay. One number left. Number one, because, well, your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with a single source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance. Absolutely free. All you have to do is visit netsuite.com slash twit. Get that KPI checklist. It's a great way to start thinking about this. NetSuite.com slash twit to get your own checklist. NetSuite.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of this week in tech. Thank you for your support, too. I should always thank the Club Twit members who make this show possible. You guys rock. If you're not yet a member, $7 a month. Get you ad-free versions of all of our shows. You wouldn't even hear this, this plug for Club Twit. You also get special shows we don't put out in public, like Hands on Macintosh with Micah Sargent, Hands on Windows with Paul Therott, the untitled Linux show, a great show all about uh, Linux and open source. We also have iOS Today in there, Home Theater Geeks. You also get access to the Club Twit Discord, where there is always a great conversation raging. I mean, if you like the kinds of conversations we have here, they continue on all week long. In our Discord, not just about the shows, but about topics all geeks are interested in. Uh, in fact, we have a very active AI section. And Anthony Nielsen, who's our AI wizard here at Twit, is very active in there. So I think a lot of benefit. But the number one benefit of joining the club is you're supporting what we're doing. You're going to keep us going 
well beyond next year. We need that because ad dollars for media is uh, just dwindling, uh, ours included. $7 a month. That's it. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. Please, if you would, consider it. We'd love to have you. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. You're talking in the uh, Discord of all things, actually, um, Harry, about the beginning of the Internet. Yeah, I mean, people always say 1969, and I guess there was a little bit being done back then involving figuring out how to make two computers talk to each other. That's when the imps got connected in yeah. Stanford and, uh, and uh, D.C., but I guess that's the Internet, sort of, but not like we know uh, well, of. Well, there's a cool conversation going on here with somebody making the case that it's really 1971, so still really early. Uh, and still, of course, 1971 is when the is the Unix epoch began, also. So maybe, and, but still, decades before most people were on the internet. I think so. You got on the internet very early. You said 78. Uh, I, actually, I would. Uh, well, that wasn't the internet. That was like BBSs. I was actually like, surprisingly late to the World Wide Web, by which by which I mean 1994. Yeah, well, that's when I, that's really when it became uh, the internet we know. But I first dialed out to computers yeah. and either. Late 78 or maybe early 79? I'm, I'm 90, 82 or so. Really? What did you do to get um, on in 82? That's uh, a long time. There's an entry in Wikipedia that talks about, um, if you look up Prodigy, it talks about that there yeah. was a pilot service in northern New Jersey, and we were a pilot household. Wow. That um, they came, they installed an extra phone jack in our, in our house, um, and I think it had a coupler modem. And it w they lent us a terminal. It was and video text. It, it was video text. Yeah. And, and I was using video text. I don't know. I don't know what year, but something like that's about right. So you really like you were lucky. This started, I think it's interesting that Prodigy led to Section 230, and now I'm a Section 230 advocate, and I used a Prodigy's precursor. But yeah. My this, my fate was written in the in stars. 1980 in France. In fact, I had a Minitel. Somebody brought me their Minitel. They, the, for some reason, the phone company, well, it was actually the government-run PTT, the Post Telegraphe Telephone, put one of these in every home in France. I think they thought they would save money on phone books. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you could buy things. You could make train reservations. You could check stock prices. Of course, there was a phone book on there. And they even had primitive email. And all of it was using something called video text, which was a... Te it was graphical, but like Prodigy, it was graphics on oh, top of the text. I didn't realize that. I think I remember video text from the service we were using, but I think it technically was a Prodigy precursor. I did not realize that then became a basis for Minitel. That's Minitel predates this. Okay. So Minitel's 1980. Okay. Uh, Prodigy's much later. But Prodigy's later, but the, the <clears throat> pilot program we were using you were doing was early, early 80s. 80s yep. Yeah. And it was using this technology. You probably knew about this video I knew about. Text. I knew of Minitel at the time. Uh, <laughs> my father joined both the Source and CompuServe, yep. which were both 1979. And Genie, General Electric had one Genie too. was a little later. Yep. Um, I was on CompuServe. A lot of our, uh, uh, our uh, old timers like me remember their CompuServe <laughs> number because you didn't have a name. And CompuServe actually goes back to 1969, but it originally it was like a, a, a business-oriented time-sharing service. And they had all this extra computing power after business hours that was going unused. And so they said, well, maybe these people buying microcomputers will, would dial into our computers and we could make some money using these untapped systems. And that that is how they got yeah, going. Yeah, it was H&R Block, right? And H&R Block they, bought them shortly thereafter. Yeah, they had a lot of computer capacity except during April. <laughs> but come May 1st, man, what are we going to do with all these computers? So they let you use them. So one of the byproducts to Minitel is France was an early adopt the French people were an early adopter to computer mediated communication in general but thus very slow to adopt the internet because they didn't need it to the same degree right so I had a job my first career before I went into law was I was a web developer and I had a job in France making websites and I had the job in 98 97 to 98 I think or was it 98 to 99 um, but it, they were running about three years behind America in terms of adoption um, and that Christmas was a real key time where adoption leapt forward because they had three telcos and each telco was offering some form of 
internet on the box. Internet in the box. You would get in this box a 14-4 modem, <laughs> um, a subscription to the dial-up for that carrier, and either um, internet ex- a CD-ROM with either Explo- Internet Explorer or um, Netscape Navigator. And um, that meant that that Christmas, an awful lot of people all of a sudden were getting up and online. And it was interesting as a web developer because a lot of the browser wars that we were suffering from in America because all the browsers were inherently incompatible, at least in this instance, IE3 and Netscape 3 were not compatible, but that was only two. At least everyone jumped in on version three, which made it much easier as a web developer because there were far fewer contingencies that you actually had to to build for. Wow. Um, but that wow. was, um, I was there at that moment of time. And now it's interesting as a lawyer, when I go to mm. France and I go to internet policy things and people are like, the internet in France. I'm like, let me tell you about the internet in France. I was <laughs> building you your internet in France. The Minitel continued in France until 2012. So wow. it lasted a long time. Here's a, this is a very French picture. This is from IEEE. Dot org, the IEEE spectrum of a guy on a Minitel. And look, he's got a little charcuterie, a little fromage, a little uh, vin d'ordinaire. He's <laughs> and I guess there's, is that uh, another Minitel? So it must be a Minitel cafe, but that is a very, <laughs> a very French. But they had them in the post offices too. Right, people people's also, houses. Yeah. They were, almost everybody had one. In fact, what I've read, I didn't, I, I, we, somebody brought us one and it's a very primitive kind of chiclet keyboard and stuff. But what I've read is it was so commonplace, it was no big deal. Everybody had, well, it was had, just in your house. But um, France Telecom had a monopoly. They also, right. around the same time exactly that I'm describing the way you don't is, want it to happen. the monopoly, they ended up with competition. So there were, I think, three telcos that were doing the dial-up. One of them was Segetel, but Segetel was brand new from that time period where it actually could compete with, with France Telecom and produce um, its Amazing. own services. Amazing. Uh, I don't know how we got onto that, but uh, <laughs> oh, I guess you guys, the you were talking in the, yeah. in the Discord I'm, during the break. That's yes, what, we were that's waxing nostalgia. Yeah. I remember the first time I got on, uh, I was using the well, the whole earth electronic Which language. Which is still around. Still yeah. around. Not the same as it was, but Stuart Brand's idea of a, of a, it was a BBS and I had run BBSs in the early 80s. I had a Macintosh BBS in 85. But, uh, the well was a very interesting place because it was very, the people in there were really smart, very interesting. It was all text. And I discovered at one point, and this must have been the mid to late 80s, that you could drop out of the interface and you'd be at a command prompt where you could run Gopher and Archie and the early internet uh, tools. It wasn't a graphical internet. There weren't browsers. And you could, and I was, I was my mind was blown that were all these Gopher and Archie servers out there, there was, you could go for, go for was a menu system and you could go to the Polytechnique Francaise or whatever and, and, and see what was there and download stuff. It was wild. I thought, there's so many people here. This is such a universe. It was a very early uh, internet before gra- graphical browsers, but I don't think that that counts even. I think you have to say it starts with the browser. It starts with Mosaic, perhaps. As a, as a consumer medium, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was an article. And that's the 90s. So you weren't far behind. At, at the time, I felt like it had been around for like a couple of years and yeah. I, I was way behind. Although I also felt the same way when I started using a TRS-80 in like 1978. I, and I think. I was like, my God, these things have existed for three years. <laughs> well, you needed a 14-4 modem before the graphical elements <laughs> of the internet useful, um, yeah. became usable. Right. Yeah. I was using the internet in 92 when I got to college, but... Um, you had the 14.4 modems, you had the invention of the World Wide Web, Mosaic, and Netscape, but you also had an article in the New York Times and somewhere along 1995 that I think was, in my mind, that was the thing that opened the door, which went from esoteric to now the public is sniffing around and, oh, this thing is, yeah. is out there. 95 was probably even more than 94, the year where it blew wide open. Wouldn't you say email would be the start? Well, well email's email. really old. I mean, as Harry was saying, you know, you you had MCI mail, which you had a number. You had G, Genie had G email. There were a variety of incompatible email systems way back when. Well, SMTP predates the World Wide Web. I don't know how far that goes yeah, back. Yeah, but, uh, but, 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 but this was, that was in academia. But if you were a normal person, your email system was MCI mail 
or CompuServe mail. And you could only, at that time, email somebody else on MCI mail. I, I mean, your ISP that. tended to provide your email. We didn't have ISPs. <laughs> I guess we must well, have. Well, that was the thing that also, I mean, <laughs> no, was well, was no, I went to college no, but, in the 90s. You, you got emails, like I think my sister in 91 got an email address from Brown. Yeah, yeah. Pe people, because uh, people I knew in high school came back, who had gone off a year before me, came back winter break of, uh, like 91 and we're telling me the story about, you know, these computers where you can send messages to each other and it's free. And I, what is this magical story they're talking about? But then when I got out to, to Berkeley in 92, I went and sought out one of these magical internet accounts and found one, but it was really difficult to find at that point because it wasn't something that the university was even mm -hmm. providing to anybody. They were little esoteric systems of like Unix boxes that some were running mainframes or something like that. And if you could get an account on then, they were all internet connected. And, yeah, that was yeah. the imp system yeah. in the early, uh, yeah. The early My dad was on the internet before I was because he worked at Boston University right. and he was an academic. I think some would say that the real era of the internet began with uh, what they call the eternal September when AOL opened... Uh, to the public. I already told <laughs> my joke to about this. Did you? <laughs> the uh, fine Mexican cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was Taco Bell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so according to Wikipedia, uh, the eternal September or September that ended, never ended is Usenet slang. Usenet is something that predates the World Wide Web, but is certainly part of the Internet for a period beginning around 1993 when internet service providers began offering Usenet access to many new users. AOL opened with its Usenet gateway service in March 1994, but from the uh, early Usenet point of view, the influx of new users in September 93 never ended. That's when the unwashed masses... And by the way, they ruined Usenet. That, <laughs> that was when it that's when it really became a public uh, facility instead of the, a university um, facility. The, uh, the immigration lawyers in Arizona ruined Usenet by inventing spam because they decided I have that's the ability right, the to first write spam. my ads here. So yeah. they're like, you can't stop yeah. me. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I don't care how anti Here's a T-shirt from the Eternal September 93. The Internet is full. Go away. <laughs> I would like that. I want that. I want that now. <laughs> Limited edition run twit swag. We should make that. Oh, we should. All right. All right. Anthony, get on that. The internet is full. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> uh, you know, I think for, for a lot of people who were on the internet when it was really an academic network, like your dad, when it became public, when AOL finally flooded it with real people, that's when it took its real character. I mean, at some point, just like selling stuff over the internet was controversial and people, there were people who thought that it should not be part of the whole idea. Yeah. Of course, I did graduate from college with a marketable skill because I'd learned how to make web pages while I was studying mass communications Very in the smart. early 90s. And then, oh, I happen to live in the Bay Area with and know how to do this. This is not a bad thing. There, there are probably people who think the internet began 20 years ago when Facebook launched. No, 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 no. Facebook, yeah. Uh, it, last Sunday, we didn't mark it, but we'll mark it now. It was the day in 2004 when Mark Zuckerberg put up the, the very first The Facebook for Harvard University students only. You, you, you all know about it because you saw the movie, the semi-fictional movie, <laughs> The Social Network. I didn't see the movie. <laughs> it's actually a good movie. Uh, the, but Facebook wasn't public for another year or two when it started to slowly branch out to other schools and eventually into the uh, the public. Facebook is I now I remember 20. the Facebook. The, you do? I was on the Facebook, yes. I was. I went to NYU, and so we got it uh, maybe a few months after Harvard. If Harvard was, yeah, a few months after. So wow. I was on the Facebook. I remember that. What yeah, was yeah. your, what do you, do you remember how you felt when you got on it? Uh, I had heard about it from uh, Live Journal. Uh, <laughs> someone was talking about it. So, so another old another name from the blast from the yeah. past. Yeah. It's uh, walled gardens all the way down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, and it's funny, the initial use cases just in school, it was literally like uh, trading like notes for class, uh, stuff like that. It was actually very college oriented for a little while, you know, maybe yeah. a year or two before becoming, I, I, I feel like the first time it became like uh, something else was when they launched, I guess when they launched the newsfeed, whatever, I feel like that was 2006, 2007, uh, and everyone freaked out 
Uh, because before you had to go to individually to people's profiles. Oh, what is what is my friend? You know, what's his favorite sports team? I would have to go to his profile page to see that. Before it was all just kind of like organized in the news feed. Uh, but yeah, it was. I definitely remember the Facebook for sure. It, there was pokes. There was. It was a weird. Pokes. It was. It was a different, entirely different. You know, I remember platform. pokes. Platform, it wasn't even a platform. You know, after being off Facebook for eight or nine years and going back last year, late last year. It was very, it's a weird experience. It's nothing like the old Facebook. It wasn't, because when I was on Facebook and when you started on Facebook, it was about people you knew. Yes. Very much not about people you Young know people you knew yeah. in most cases. Right. Now it's old people you don't know. Well, people have yeah, always you done. couldn't even see. Like, if I was on the NYU network, I don't think I could see people other in other schools. colleges. Oh, that's, it, yeah. was a, it, was, it was only NYU. Yeah, it was yeah. a big deal. Me, you used to have to be able to authenticate your school email right, in order to right. get on. Yeah, yes. The EDU. Yes. Yeah. Here's some good news. Uh, the music industry, uh, actually, was it music or was it filmmakers? I think it was actually the, the Hollywood filed lawsuit against Reddit saying, you got to give us the IP addresses of people who talk about piracy on Reddit. In fact, uh, I probably should enlist our uh, official uh, attorney here on this one. Uh, the company attempted to block it. Um, they said, well, no, we don't want to give you that. And courts have surprisingly ruled in favor of Reddit and you and they do not have to hand over these IP addresses. This is one of a number of privacy or sorry, piracy lawsuits against uh, Internet service providers on behalf of independent film companies. I suspect I haven't I haven't digested this decision yet, although I need to. I think these are DMCA subpoenas. Um and I think the open question was, although I'm not entirely positive, it's possible that these shifted in some way, but the DMCA has a subpoena mechanism. And one of the things that has been happening is that subpoena mechanism seems to have been un unlimited by any First Amendment concerns for the right to anonymous speech. It operates on its own orbit um, and isn't subject to the same type of review that other forms of... Um, subpoena authority would have with, you know, huge damage to what happens to anonymous speech if a 512 subpoena can all of a sudden unmask people who are having discourse like on Reddit. And so Reddit, to its credit, has been fighting back about these um, un unlimited subpoenas and saying, no, the First Amendment has to actually come into the picture somewhere. The I'd lawyers are not going to stop. They say they're going to continue. This is the third time. Well, around the film companies, including, I'm reading from uh, Torrent Freak, including Voltage Holdings and Scream Media Ventures, wanted to use the pro-piracy comments made by six Redditors to show that they didn't take the ISP. Are they talking about Reddit or their ISPs? I guess their ISPs, because that's why they want the IP addresses, not the names. That their ISPs didn't take proper action against repeat infringers or that lax enforcement acted as a draw. <clears throat> so they weren't asking. In fact, they thought they might get away with this one because they said, "We don't want the names, Your Honor. We're not. We're not looking to uh, infringe on these people's privacy. We just want their IP address so that we can then contact their ISPs and say, get these people.'" <laughs> uh, the the judge, thank goodness, the magistrate judge uh, Thomas Hickson of the California Federal Court denied the motion to compel. So that's now the third time, three strikes, I wish they were out, they're not, that these movie companies have been thwarted in their attempt uh, to go after the ISPs by getting people who mention it on Reddit. Uh, and of course, the judge said, no, 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 you have a First Amendment right. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that holds up and credit to Reddit um, for pursuing it. I mean, the the, the I've, I'm working on a paper right now about the the First Amendment problems with the DMCA because... Uh, oh, it basically, I think, has a large prior restraint problem where the accusations of piracy can cause uh, speakers and speech to be disappeared, even though there's never been any adjudication for whether that, that speech is truly wrongful or not. Um, and hello, the First Amendment really shouldn't uh, support that sort of thing. So if that's what uh, an aspect of copyright law is allowing, then copyright law has a First Amendment problem and the two have to play together. SCOTUS um, is going to be very, uh, you were mentioning this before the show, busy. Uh, their docket this year had a lot of not just First Amendment uh, stories, but social media uh, A lot of cases. internet 
things. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting times. Um, so we're going to, these, these, they've already heard oral arguments for all of these, have they? Or no, 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 it's okay. coming up. Um, the, the net choice CCIA cases, mm, which that's is the big one. Yes, it is. Well, it's certainly a big one. Maybe it is the biggest one because it's also a double case. Florida um, and Texas. Florida and Texas. So Texas wanted to impose regulation that would force platforms to moderate in certain ways. And Florida had regulation that would force platforms to moderate in certain ways. The platforms largely won uh, at a, the appeals court. Well, everybody won at the district. Uh, the platforms all won in the district court, I believe. No, I, let me take that back. Everything's weird in Texas. Uh, but basically, the 11th Circuit mostly gave a win to the platforms to say, back off state, you don't get to do this, although it didn't enjoin all of the provisions. Um, and in the 5th Circuit, the Texas law, the 5th Circuit is a very weird circuit that basically just makes up law however it wants to <laughs> and um, it, without being pejorative in a very MAGA uh, uh, acceptable way. And they basically... They, they produced a decision that really sort of trashed a lot of First Amendment both, precedent both, and logic. Both these cases really come down to the fact that Twitter banned President Trump after on January 7th. And they, uh, right, am I wrong? That they really want to have the state's attorneys general have the right to tell social media you cannot or you must ban this person or this kind of content. I don't know if, if Trump is necessarily the instigating point for all of it, but they, they sure was, didn't like it. Well, they sure didn't like it, but Trump wasn't the only person kicked off of social media. And the, the laws are framed a little differently. Like the ones in Florida is, I think, focused more on, oh, you can't disqualify journalism and what it counts as a journalist. And it, they're each framed somewhat differently, yeah. but the effect is the same. The states basically want to be able to tell the platforms what they must or must not platform or deplatform and that's got a big first amendment problem but you have the issue You're at the telling a is, private business who they can do business the with. question is whether the platform so there is it doesn't even seem like a speech issue no it is definitely a speech okay. issue because so there's an old case called miami herald versus torneo and that case the supreme court said that the government could not force a newspaper to run an op-ed it did not want to run like right. you could not have fairness doctrine type things, okay. particularly with something like newspapers where government doesn't get to regulate at all. And um, the question is whether, essentially boils down to whether that is the analogy that applies to a platform or not. And a lot of the states and some of the other people who want to be able to force the platforms to moderate the way they want to, mostly because <laughs> they've gotten deplatformed and they don't like that, um, want to say, no, 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 um, they're, they're, um, uh, Oh, I can't even remember because it's such a bad term. But the idea, no, you have to take all co comers, your common carriers. That's the term they want to We know use. they're not common carriers. They should that's not absurd. be. That, that It's absurd. And that's the phone not the company way. is a common carrier. It, the phone company can't be told what yeah. who to has. A, you can't have a phone. Right. You, you're you too if, liberal. You can't have a phone. You're, you're, you can't have a phone. The, the indicia that applies to an actual common carrier is does not apply to no. a private platform. Are, are they publishers though? That's the question. Are they like a newspaper? Are they publishers? Well, the idea is that um, they would, they have the same sort of first amendment rights and editorial discretion that as a, publisher. A, as, a as, yeah, I mean, I really hate the term publisher. I don't use it in my advocacy because it tends to confuse people, right. but, um, but essentially, they are that exercise of their own editorial and associative discretion is something that the First Amendment should protect. If it doesn't protect it, then Texas and Florida can order anybody around. Although then there may be commerce clause in Section Two. Where do these issues. Where do these uh, laws stand right now? In both cases, they've been suspended temporarily. Um, by the lower they. Courts. There are provisions in the Florida one that have not technically been enjoined, but oh, okay. I don't know if anyone's enforcing it, but it's largely enjoined. Okay. And in Texas, it's technically enjoined, but not via the same mechanism. I think it's basically a stay. But, but neither state has done anything to... They can't yet. Yet, okay. Um, but as soon as the Supreme Court rules, we'll be off to the races. And those uh, hearings, oral arguments will be... So that one is February 26th. Okay, soon. A so, couple oh, of weeks. yeah imminently okay. and then um and a whole bunch of amicus briefs have come in recently have you filed one for uh... i have so my client in the cases for um for the net choice cases is um uh the copia institute which is mike masnick at tech dirt um 
it is Chris Riley, who is an individual Mastodon administrator, because we wanted to point out how expressive the editorial choices are, because that is a single human being that in theory, Texas and Florida and Utah and California could all boss yeah, around. I, I'm, he, a, I'm another one. I run my own run Mastodon. Own, yes. I, ma I moderate it solely on... On my uh, dis decisions, I do not want to be told what I... Exactly. Oh, and you can't block that person. So we bring an individual to bear to really illustrate what editorial discretion yeah. looks like and why it needs to be protected. This is and one also, problem because a lot of the legislators act as if it's big tech only that Section 230 right. in a separate kind of idea, no. but it affects, but it affects me too. It does. It affects small people yeah. too. And it's arguably, important that they understand the, that. Arguably, these two laws from Texas and Florida attempt to only reach big, but it is not quite clear that they only reach big and the principle would essentially allow them to reach small. Right. Uh, so we did that. And the third client on it actually for the net choice cases is Blue Sky itself. Because okay. one of the things we're pointing out is that this fixation on everything is big tech and it's just Twitter, Facebook, Google, et cetera, is wrong and that there's an entire ecosystem that needs to be protected and that there's other avenues for getting speakers and speech online. So a lot of the policy thing that was sort of driving the sense of, oh, we must do something is a myth and it, it shouldn't be suborned. Anything else we should be watching on the then Supreme in Court March, docket this year? In March um, is the case Murphy versus Biden. And this is one where um, everybody got, well, let me not beat that to colloquial, but um, many people got mad at re revelations that the members of the Biden administration and a variety of executive branch agencies were having conversations with the platforms and the results of those mod conversations seems to have affected um, moderation policy. So In this case, Murphy is Governor Murphy of... Uh no, Murphy no? is um, the uh, uh, Surgeon General. Oh, the Surgeon. Yeah, oh, this, okay. this was originally Missouri versus Biden, but now that it's at the Supreme Court, the caption has changed. Okay. Um, and so it's the Missouri uh, Surgeon General. No. Uh, U.S. The, Surgeon General. U.S. Surgeon because, General. So basically, a number. Oh, they were of, trying to have conversations with about COVID. So the plaintiffs in this case are a number of people largely anti-vaxxers who got deplatformed, plus the states of Louisiana and the state of Missouri. Um, and they sued the Biden administration under the theory that the Biden administration was the state actor that caused the censorship of their deplatforming. And uh, in this was at the, the injunction stage and the district court came out with an injunction that the Fifth Circuit narrowed slightly, but still left largely intact, which basically enjoined federal agencies and made it impossible for them to talk to platforms under this theory that any deplatforming happened was uh, not attenuated at all. It was all at their, their direction, which is not supported by the facts, not supported by the record. But the big problem is now you have an injunction where the federal agencies cannot talk to the platforms, which means that the platforms cannot talk to the federal agencies. So I wrote an amicus brief in this case, or, um, this was just the Copia Institute one, but pointing out that, again, the platforms have their own First Amendment rights. They have their First Amendment rights to moderate how they see fit. And if they want to come up with a policy that deals with you know vaccine information, Maybe it makes sense to talk to the administration administration agency tasked with coming up with, uh, you know, with expertise in vaccines. And the other thing is there's the First Amendment right to petition. You the uh, It's in the First Amendment. You have the right to petition the government, which basically means you have the right to talk to your government. And this injunction interferes with that. So we wrote it's a... It's interesting that it's know. going in that direction because, of, of course, the proponents of this are concerned more that the government's going to tell social media what to do. Well, that's what they're very concerned about. And if it actually did happen where the where the federal government said, you moderate it this way or else, you know, if it's really pressing the platform's hands like that, then there actually is a constitutional problem. But that's not what the record supports. And even if it did, this is not the remedy for it, right. because this remedy cuts off all future conversations. And well, for instance, one of the conversations could be, this is a known terrorist group that's posting con content on Twitter and, and they're recruiting uh, for terrorism. We're not telling you to take them down, but you should know this. Well, it's also- That it's, would be appropriate, right? It, it you should know this. It hasn't just cut off Surgeon General, it's also cut off CISA, so they can't talk about Security. cyber threats. Yep. Um, they don't like anybody talking about election It's reasonable though to say the government shouldn't be allowed to say, take this guy down, 
but there should be informational and the uh, government can't force it they can't right. say and but so it's an informational conversation to say look this guy's uh disseminating a malware on your platform you might want to do something about it what the plaintiffs are alleging is that the government did say things along those lines, and yeah. they think that's too heavy-handed. Well, if the, it's true. If a federal government says, we think it would be advisable for you to do something, I think that's the, got some weight behind it. it. The question There is a question of how is there enough weight, because I think the record does not show that there's enough weight that there was actually state action here. I think the you want... The platforms could say no. I think you want the platforms to have information. You want them to have you information. You want this flow of information. Yeah, you don't you want... You don't want the government to tell them what to do, but you do want this flow of information. Right. So the government... So the there's an issue of fact, although I think the record really doesn't get far enough to say whether the government said, you take this Does down Scotus or Does SCOTUS care about that? I don't understand this court very well, so it's a little unclear. But I we ended up filing a brief in support of neither the government nor the um, nor the plaintiffs, basically pointing out. But the platforms, the the problem with this case right now is it isn't really a question of whether there was state action and whether the people who got deplatformed truly got deplatformed because the state forced the platforms to do that. It kind of is irrelevant because the injunction basically said going forward, all these federal agencies you're enjoined, you don't get to talk to the platforms. Right. And the functional effect of this non-narrow and incredibly broad injunction is a whole bunch of agencies can't talk to the platforms, which means that the platforms can't talk to the government agencies, their own government, their own agencies who have expertise in matters that would help them. You make, should be able to ask. You should be able to ask. Is this guy a terrorist? So, what do you know? So we made an argument that basically, like, whatever you think happened probably didn't happen here, but this is not how you fix right. it. There should be some flow of information, but maybe there should be a bright line where you can't cross, where the government says, yeah, take this guy. We probably down. have one. I'm not sure the plaintiffs have made out the case. There's right. another I'm problem. I'm sure Twitter always, ha Twitter always has the right to say, no, yeah, we're not going to do that. As long as Twitter has the right to say no, yeah. there's no constitutional injury. Ish, the ish. other problem with this is what is Missouri and Louisiana doing bringing this lawsuit? Yeah, what's their standing? Yeah, and, yeah. and the fact that the uh, Fifth Circuit found that Louisiana and Missouri had their own First Amendment rights. <laughs> That's a super to, one. <laughs> uh, th th this is not good. Um, and there's... I've spent this week reading a lot of really depressing uh, amicus briefs on the side of the, um, the, the, the plaintiffs here. We're going to take a little break. Uh, we will come back with some final thoughts with our great panel. Uh, but uh, first, a word from Robin Hood. This episode brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Thank you, Robinhood. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. Uh, hey, we had a great week this week on Twit. We prepared a little movie for your enjoyment. Something you don't know about this, the camera angle is based on where the window is. If I move the window, it's like there's a, like a crane <laughs> shot is going on. Previously on Twit. Mac Break Weekly. It's Vision Pro time. A lot of the things I need to build are window management. I literally said last week, oh, I left my settings app in the garage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it is, on one level, it's brilliant. Hands on tech. It is time to answer all the questions you've asked about the Apple Vision Pro. How it works, what the performance is like, whether it's worth purchasing, and so much more. Windows Weekly. I've made two mm -hmm. GPTs, which I use all the time. I give it all these classic lists books. They're references for me. They're fantastic. And I think the thing you just described is going to be the moment. It's coming. It's going to come in like two days. It's 
when I go to my mechanic and he does what you just described, or you go to, you know, I'm trying to think of examples. In your phone. So yes. you can literally. Yeah, you're under your the phone. car and you're like, what is this what's thing the do? part for this yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is not science fiction. This is not someday oh, soon. Like, this is, it I'm be using right it. Now. If you missed Twit this week, you missed a lot. I, 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 it's always sad, but I like to do this. And with you, Harry, because I feel like you're our, uh, you're our historian of technology. Uh, I would like to do a couple of obituaries. We want to pay attention to this. The technology has been around long enough now that people are passing away. Have you ever read The Code Breakers? And not only have read it, I gave a copy of it to my nephew for Christmas. It's a great uh, book. A, a really groundbreaking the book one. on crypto, if you ask me. Yes. Right? I didn't realize it was uh, so old. It's 1967. Uh, written by David Kahn, who passed away at the age of 93 this week. But the book remains, even as old as it is, the kind of definitive work on cryptography. It's definitive and it inspired a lot of people who then went on to work in cryptography, which starting around that time frame turned out to be a really important thing in, on a number of fronts. Yeah, the cypherpunks and people like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, is and, it dated? And, and you you gave it to your nephew at I, I gave last him a, a Christmas. Of, yes, I did. I, I I gave him my own personal copy because wow. I thought he would enjoy it. And uh, wow, I'm thinking I'm going to pull it off the shelf and uh, reread it because it's been a long time since I've read this. And uh, I mean, the government tried to prevent it from being published. Uh, it was so good. A history of uh, starting with the Egyptians of uh, crypto, but also a great uh, introduction. Uh, to how this all works. And that still holds true. It's still uh, appropriate. David Kahn, the Code Breakers, he passed at the age of 93, ripe old age of 93. Uh, not the only loss this week. We also lost John Walker, who was the founder of Autodesk. People will well remember uh, Walker. Um, he uh, Did he write uh, uh, AutoCAD before? Founding Autodesk, was it one of those situations, or do you know? I don't know the exact uh, order that things happened in, but yeah. I mean, um, Autodesk has got to be one of the most important software companies that don't people, people don't talk about all that much, just because so many of the things we touch every day were built in AutoCAD. Um, I mean, it's sort of a little bit like Photoshop, except people do think about Photoshop touching a lot of our world. Um, AutoCAD is exactly the same. There must be an innumerable number of the things in, in this room we're sitting in Absolutely. That, that were designed, designed, designed in AutoCAD. In AutoCAD yeah. And uh, walk, you walk down the street and you pass them too. So. And it used a version of Lisp as well as it's a coding language, AutoLisp. So uh, very and, sad news. And uh, one of the few pieces of software that has mattered as much as it has for as long as it has. Yeah, yeah. John Walker wasn't uh, was a young man in my mind. He uh, was born in 1949, so he was uh, 75. Uh, at his passing. Um, that's about all there is to say about it, but he will be uh, very fondly remembered. Steven Sanofsky posted a very, I thought, very nice and thoughtful uh, post on Twitter talking about not only uh, the passing of John Walker, but the influence his work had on the early days of Microsoft, Bill Gates, um, and so forth. So, uh, that wraps it up for this edition of This Week in Tech. Always great to have our official counselor, Kathy Gellis, on. It's great to have you in studio. She writes at Tech Dirt and obviously uh, does briefs for the Copia Institute. Uh, have you ever, you're admitted before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you could argue a case if you if it came up? Um, yeah, in theory, I, that's how I get to I, file these amicus briefs. You've never had a chance to do that, though. No, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'll hire you next time we have a big Supreme Court case. Okay. You'll be the first person on my list. I, I'm glad. Yes. So great I, I want to be you. your favorite Supreme Court <laughs> you bar are. member. Okay. You are. CGCouncil.com. C-G-C-O-U-N-S-E-L.com. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Nicholas de Leon, who writes, of course, regularly in Consumer Reports. He's their senior electronics reporter. Are you working on anything... Uh, for a, f a future episode that we should think about? Uh, I think in the upcoming magazine, I've got something on all the different email clients. Again, this is probably not stuff for your audience necessarily. Uh, oh, but no, we're interested in that. No, that's there. good. What do you like? Just a break. 
Uh, I mean, I actually kind of like the new Outlook for for I, I'm on Windows 11 right now. It, it's it's kind of neat, uh, and they're just looking at some of the things it can do. Uh, Apple Mail, what that can do in the phone, and uh, I guess some Gmail tips that you may not know nice. or our readers probably don't know. Nice. So that's coming out. I don't know when, whenever that hits uh, store shelves. I was uh, new stands, I was briefly uh, flirting with the idea of writing a weekly column for uh, the. AARP magazine, <laughs> but but I kind of I got in a little tiff with the editor. Uh, the person, the, my media editor, uh, said make this uh, more technical, and then the top, the editor in chief said make it less technical. And since they <laughs> couldn't seem to agree on how they wanted me to do this, I said you know yeah. maybe we'll do this later. But uh, but so. the big pitch was you'll reach more people over sixty five than uh, anybody else. <laughs> I thought great, just what I need. My peers, I guess they would be. Anyway, Nicholas, thank you for the work you do. It is very important, and I'm always glad to have you on. And I am a long time uh, member thank of you. Consumer, what was Consumer Union, and subscriber to Consumer Reports. It's it's a must have journal. Thank you, Nicholas. Appreciate it. And Harry McCracken, my good friend, thank you for bringing Marie. I asked you to bring her. And it's a good thing we had, what is this stuff? That soda that you like. Calamansi. It's a, it's a Filipino fruit, a lime-like fruit. And we had, for some reason, I think somebody in our continuity department likes it. And Marie said, ah, I love it. We take all the cans with you. <laughs> Take them all with you. It's all right. You can, you can, uh, we'll get, there's, we can make more. No, you need to have them so you can lure her back. Well, she'll come yeah. back. Because okay. we'll lure Harry back. What okay. can we have to lure you back? The Coleman seat may be more of a uh, way to get her here than me. <laughs> <laughs> Harry McCracken is the global technology editor for Fast Company. Love the stuff you write. You're, uh, you're our internet historian or your technology historian, but also, uh, you know, the stuff you're writing on Vision Pro right now is thoughtful insightful uh and not link baity which Thank i really you. appreciate it's, it's one of the more fun things i've done lately just because yeah. it is so new yeah yeah i really appreciate it uh you can also follow him on mastodon he's on mastodon.social harry mccracken and subscribe to my newsletter plugged oh, in very important which plugged you, in. you can find if you go to fast company and scroll down we'll probably urge you to subscribe at the bottom of a lot of the pages i'm pretty sure i'm already a subscriber so i'll make sure i i make sure i am um, uh, the problem with newsletters is they keep ending up in my uh, in my spam folders, so I've got to I've got to approve it and get it. Actually, in. I read my newsletters in this app called Matter rather than reading them in my ah, email, and it's it's quite handy. Matter's for that. great. I also yeah, you know what I do now is I uh, there's one called there's an open source app called Omnivore that does the same thing, but you have to give. <laughs> I really screwed up my subscription and the information by changing my email address to this bizarre long omnivore address, and now I have to remember it to log in. Matter, yeah, matter. Um, I don't have to do that with matter. You, you, you allow matter to look into your Gmail, oh, so perfect. it's a, a little more seamless. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks to all of you, and I appreciate especially our Club Twit members joining us today. We do Twit every... Now, we were early because of this big game that's coming up, but we normally do the show every uh, Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. You can watch us live as soon as the show starts at youtube.com slash twit. But of course, for most people, the best thing to do is subscribe. That way you'll get it automatically the minute the show is available, uh, which usually takes an hour or two after the show to put that out. Uh, you can also uh, watch it on YouTube. There's a dedicated YouTube channel. we got audio and video. Or go to the website, twit.tv, and download a copy. I thank you so much for watching. We've been doing this for a few years. I know it feels like a long show, but imagine we've been doing it for 15 years now. That's pretty, more than that. More than that. More than 19 years. Oh, gosh. Time. 15 years. <laughs> 19 years. And for 19 years, I've been saying the same thing at the end of every show. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Yes.